that today. I'm going to try. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting. It's a joint meeting with the, with the Water Commissioners. Uh, the agenda for tonight is uh, meeting with the Water Commissioners to talk about <coughs> Light and Water, the financials, 21 budget, Light and Water projects, temporary transmission main, permanent transmission main, Wickham Avenue treatment plant, Cedar Hill tank, item B, 21 sewer project, C, sewer project and home rule petition, D, Wickham Avenue treatment plant. Around 6.45, a joint meeting with the Water Commissioners again to talk about the Littleton Landfill, PFAS testing, the responsibility matrix, communication plans. You know, if we go on plans at 7.30, the board will now then meet jointly with the planning board to consider appointment of a fifth um, member of the planning board uh, and then to talk about the master plan. Um, this joint meeting with the uh, Water Commissioners, I think, is a very important Meeting a lot of good issues, a lot of issues that the water department wants to bring up. So we're now I'll turn it over to the chairman, Kaf, and water commissioners on the pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance, Mr. Thank Chair. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as we um, spoke in the special town meeting in November. You know, there's been a lot of issues coming up with uh, the water department. Um, the chair and I have spoke along with the town administrator and the general manager about having a joint meeting. Uh, we think it's very important that not only the water commissioners are uh, on top of and informed about what's going on with the uh, water resources, but the Board of Selectmen also should be in uh, up to date and um, what better way to do it but a joint meeting. Also, the residents in town um, who we're, we represent and the stewards of their water, um, having it on TV is a fantastic idea too. So um, tonight we'll talk about uh, not only <clears throat> budgets going into fiscal year 21, we're going to talk about uh, water issues that were brought up in our uh, special town meeting with PFAS and our solutions and moving forward along with the sewer update. So uh, we're going to turn it over to our general manager. He's got a slideshow for us. During the slideshow, any comments, conversations we want to have, by all means, uh, that's what we're here for. Nick? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I, I put this together today. Um, it's really just meant to kind of keep us all focused on all the issues that are going on. This isn't overly formal, so feel free as we're going through this, please interject, ask your questions uh, as they come up. Um, you know, this started, I think Joe and Jim, we met with Nina, I don't know, maybe a month ago, just talk about some of the financial struggles that uh, the water department's up against due to, to the PFAS contamination, um, which we found in August. Mm -hmm. Um, but then obviously a few other things have kind of spurned up since then. Uh, so, you know, the water department really appreciates it, as I know Nina does, uh, this joint meeting. <clears throat> um, so just the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll walk through the financials. We'll explain uh, the issues and the increases that the water department's facing due to the high cost of treating PFAS. Uh, we'll look at a draft um, sewer budget. Uh, that the Board of Commissioners had seen at the last meeting. Uh, I can give a brief update and answer questions on the sewer project, the home petition that got filed uh, with that, the Wickham Ave Treatment Plant, which I know is a very um, uh, long-awaited project. Uh, and then we, can, then we can end it with the uh, Littleton Landfill and PFAS testing um, conversation, which is very important. So this is the draft budget that, again, the Board of Commissioners saw at their last meeting. Um, we don't typically bring this level of detail to the Board of Selectmen, but I thought it was important to, to kind of let the Board know what we were up against. Um, <clears throat> overall, the budget actually goes down, uh, which, should, which should be a good thing, but it's kind of the calm before the storm because we're starting to borrow money to build projects, but, but they're, they're short-term bans, uh, so we're just paying interest and we're not fully paying the principal and interest yet. Um, and as these projects start to be constructed, uh, the costs are gonna increase drastically. Our water department staff have done an incredible job of trying to fine tune the areas the way they could. 
um, including capital. And if you look at the capital budget, it's down 432 grand over last year. Part of that's due to the fact that we no longer have to put money to spec pond treatment plant, which was uh, required a lot of deferred maintenance from from when it got uh, put online. Um, but then you can see our admin budget is going up, and that's as the as our principal bond principal and interest payments go up. That's where that hits the budget. Um, there was $13 million that we had prior uh, body authorization from uh, the Wickham Ave treatment plant and the PFAS from uh, infrastructure uh, borrowing from last town meeting. We're looking for another $13 million uh, this year. So that's going to be going to go up to $26 million of, of needed borrowing authorization to finish some of these projects that, that we so desperately need to do. We informed town meeting last year that this was coming. We tried to be as, as straightforward as we could because uh, we knew it was going to be a, a hit to the rates. Uh, so that's the overall draft budget. I don't know if there's any specific questions on that. It also includes a Cedar Hill replacement. Right. So what? Capital. That's correct. So uh, part of that special appropriations is $3 million for Cedar Hill, which we can get into a little bit later uh, when we look at the, at the, at the specific, specific projects. Uh, the only comment that I'll have is, in, as far as capital equipment and uh, <coughs> that that, that also incl includes our infrastructure. You know, and we're working with uh, Chris started um, with roads constantly. Uh, him and Nick have been communicating fantastic about roads. What we're trying to do is set aside at least one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year for infrastructure needs. So when the town says we're going to do Hartwell Ave. Well, that infrastructure there has been there for 120 years. We need to deal with that. We'll at least have some budgeted money in the kitty to be able to deal with the infrastructure. So that's why we still ha we need some in there, and 200000 isn't that much, but we need to at least have some infrastructure money in there. Yeah, and thanks for giving me the credit for that, but it's really Chris and Kevin that, that work closely together on that, on that type of project in Foster Street. This year was a, was the perfect example of those two working together uh, to try to hit both infrastructure needs at the same time. Um, so this puts a it's 150 grand a year, and it's in, in our five year plan. It's every year moving forward to keep on uh, putting money towards uh, the buried infrastructure. Now maybe we don't spend it that year, and hopefully we'll try to figure out a way we can carry it over and start to build a fund just dedicated towards water main infrastructure. It's something that's been put off for. So, Years. So, so anytime the highway is going after replacing a road, yep. they can coordinate with you guys. Yep. And so the, they're not taking the road up six months the, later or six yep. years later and having to replace the water main. Yeah, and for the for the past year in, into right. this year, they've they've been working very closely together on that. Um, yep. It's going to work. It's good. Sure, and, and that's that's a common problem in most water departments. It's very easy to, to turn a blind eye to. to what's in the ground because there's so many other issues that we're dealing with right now with treatment plants with uh, storage I mean our infrastructure is 100 years old um, so it was a great decision by the Board of Water Commission last meeting to, to, to fund that moving forward continually as far as the grant funded projects go it makes sense to me that there's nothing there with respect to water treatment infrastructure for fiscal year 2021 what are you guys hearing with respect to state appropriations to help us offset some of the treatment costs? Well, we've met with DEP a couple of times, and, um, you know, the governor did sign, I believe it was $5 million? Uh, mm -hmm. No, $6 million. Six million. Yeah, it was yeah. $6 million. Uh, Yeah, it's not much, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what, what the state's saying, it's for testing only. So not for infrastructure, not for building out plants. So... Uh, Corey's on top of it, um, dealing with DEP and EEA. Uh, you know, we're, we're we're hoping we're on the first in line. You know, we've been very proactive with them, so um, we'll see. It just hasn't been released yet. Or details. Have you heard any details on the grants yet? Well, the one thing um, Nick and I met with the people from the SRF program um, at the state a couple weeks ago, and looks like we might be able to get in line for. Um, very low interest financing on some of the PFAS infrastructure and potentially as low as 0% interest loans. That's yeah. where some of that state money is so going. You'll, you'll see in my projections, I carried 1.5% um, for borrowing, but it, it's potential, it's 0%. Yeah. 
Cheap loans are good. I would rather have an appropriation. <laughs> um, and I, I can assure you there's nobody better getting grants than Corey. He gets grants for us every year, uh, including just got $70,000 uh, last week uh, for a project that he's been working on with Westridge for the last three or four years. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to, to meet with them and beat that drum. Um, so one, one thing we continually do is, is look at a five-year plan, which looks one year back, current year, and three years forward. Um, <clears throat> as you can see, so this is just the expense side. I'll show you the revenue side afterwards. But as you can see, the expenses last year were, were a total of $3.88 million, and they're going up to 5.56. It's a 43% increase. And the majority of that lies in the um, bond principal and interest payments. Um, we can, we've historically been around $400,000 a year, and it's going to go up to about $2, two million um, <coughs> every year that we have to pay off that, that debt. Um, and as, as Jim see, you, if you look at the capital, uh, there's 150 grand a year plugged in there for water main. And the production and treatment, the capital expenditures there has dropped off due to the fact that, again, Spec Pond has gone away, and that was kind of... That was the money pit. We were, every year we were sinking money into, into that treatment plant to keep it functional. Um, you know, and, and the one one other thing I'd like to point out here is we, we've plugged in zero money for Cobb's well. So everything we talk about has nothing to do with procuring or getting um, new water. This is just trying to keep the resources we have as good as we have them. Uh, and everything we've done so far for, for either Cobb's or NAGOG has been funded through our, our, our operations budget hasn't been funded through borrowing. But at some point, if those projects were to come to fruition, either through a withdrawal permit or a um, uh, SJC court victory, um, then we need to put money into infrastructure. That would be a borrowing. Now, spec bonds offline completely right now? So we don't, that's a tricky question, Joe. <laughs> um, spec pond is currently offline. It doesn't need to be offline per the DEP. Uh, the Board of Water Commissioners has made a conscious effort to take it offline because it's over the 20 parts per trillion, which is going to be a standard at some point. That has put a lot of stress on our operators and our existing infrastructure because now all we have is Wickham Ave and Beaver Brook. Um, they're doing an incredible job keeping those two plants going and being what feeds our town, at some point, I'm not, I'm not sure if we can continue to do that, which is why we're trying to get that blending pipeline online, because once we get that blending pipeline in, so that was the pipeline that we talked about at town meeting that's going to blend the water from Beaver Brook to Spec Pond, that will get the concentration of Spec Pond under 20 parts per trillion. We can add at least part of that capacity back on. Spec Pond is 52% of our water capacity, so it's taking that offline is a big hit. Um, right now, it's, we're in winter. Uh, it's a better time to be able to do that. But once people, you know, start using water, it's going to be tough. And one comment about the um, Cobb's well. I mean, that's not only their job, but our responsibility to make sure that we have enough water for our the residents in town. Um, that process started five years ago? Cobb's? Yeah. 12. Yeah, it really started yeah. 12 years ago. Okay. 12 yeah. years ago. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So and we've got to a point where we've, we've done some testing. There was some positive <laughs> testing. And then all of a sudden, Concord stepped in with this NAGOG lawsuit and kind of we, we, we stopped, um, <clears throat> slowed down the progress in testing and all that. But again, DEP has been very resourceful for us and helping us out in regards to COPS. But eventually, we're going to need more water. That's We have more residents coming in town. You know, our population is going to grow probably the 2020 uh, census is going to, we're going to be over 10,000. And, you know, that just means more usage. So Nick was right to put it up there. Um, eventually, those zeros are going to have to be filled in, though. Yeah, it's just important to just to mention that. Everything we're doing is all it's doing is keeping us operating at the current levels of how we operate. Um, now, some of the improvements do, you know, replacing the wells at Wickham Ave, it does help because those are newer wells, they'll get more water out of the ground. Um, but it's not the it's not the complete long term story that we need to get secure water source. We're one drought away of being in serious trouble. 
boy, this went this far. Yeah. Right, now you sound like Paul. Even <laughs> <laughs> well, with standard, uh, standard water use this spring and, uh, and early summer is going to come with uh, some, uh, some stricter uh, water restrictions water. Yeah, than, yeah. Uh, than the people have seen in the past. Yeah. And so this is yeah. actually a good time to get that out. Yeah, yeah so uh, I mean, it's, it's a it's water coming. van right now. Yeah, right. Yeah, no. it's all out water van. And it'll get stricter. Of course, nobody's watering right now, but there's no in, there's no intentions of lifting that watering ban this summer because we can't I stop showering. <laughs> yeah, that's what that was. Huh? I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't stop it. <laughs> um, so to make up for this, this expense, we have what's called a debt service charge on the bill, and that what that debt service charge does is it follows our our. Um, a debt service. So as that goes up, so does the debt service charge. If you look at it, you know, last just this past year at two dollars and forty five cents per thousand gallons, that's gonna go to six forty seven. That's a hundred and sixty four percent increase in just that part of the bill. Um, but that hits you know that hits our residents, that hits our, our commercial you know users, it hits it hits all everybody. Um, that's a per gallon charge. Um, there's other ways we can make money. Obviously, there's connection fees. So as these developments come into town and they um, want to connect to our water, there's connection fees there. Uh, but we can't live off that. To us, that just replenishes. Um, Those are one-time charges. One-time charges. Right. Uh, the cell tower money. We, we, you know, we're fortunate enough to get some of the cell tower money that that we manage for the town. That's that's in there. Um, we. If you look at the bottom, we, we, we strive to hit a million dollars a year to, um, in the operating reserve fund. Not back when that was set, it was that was six months operating, um, and that was a, a goal of the commission. It's not six months anymore; it's probably four. Uh, but that was that's where that million dollars came from. Uh, that back in 2014 or 13, in that period, we had 128 thousand dollars in the bank, and we were close to going bankrupt. Uh, so Scott Edwards, when he took over as general manager, that's when he brought in the debt service charge, and that's when we started to build that fund up to a million dollars to be able to cover our operating expenses, especially when we bill quarterly. Uh, it's very seasonal related, so you, you can't live off $120,000. Um, it, it was a recipe for disaster. Uh, I don't know if there are any comments on the, on the five-year outlook. I want to throw something out there, just um, assuming everything goes forward with the sewer. And we start repurposing some of that gray water and maybe pushing over to Middlesex Corp or something like that. I would assume that would have some sort of an impact if they're not pulling pristine water, they're pulling gray water to do concrete or other commercial uses. I would, I would imagine that would have a pretty significant impact on usage. I don't know what kind of gallons we're talking. I don't either. Yeah. Volumes. Yeah, so when we, we can table that a little bit for the sewer discussion. Um, but we haven't seen numbers yet on what the gallons are for that reused water and and if it's financially beneficial. Um, that, that's part of what CDM's looking at. I think in terms of volumes, though, we've always thought that that <clears throat> would be a significant volume with respect to the user, but probably not a significant volume with respect to the, the town's system. total use. Yeah. You know, Middlesex could see a lot of cost savings there and frankly kick some money to us but um, agri was interested too uh, yeah. and uh, in uh, the ski area there's people out there interested mm -hmm. yeah but it's not going to offset uh, <coughs> yeah I'm just do you remember chase what i i, I only remember the general impression that it it would be useful weston and samson thought it was economically viable um uh, we'll see what Sure. CDM says, yeah. um, but at the end of the day, it helps the water department, but it's not a game changer. Right. Um, so that's kind of how it looks from, from a department standpoint. But I think what more people care about is how does it look from for your average resident. <coughs> I went all the way back to 2013 when I when I built this graph because really that's when rates started to change, and I think. I can't remember the last rate increase prior to 2014. I mean, I don't know. No, it, it was a while. It was a while, um, <clears throat> which led to some of the financial issues that we had and almost being bankrupt. Um, but in 2013, it was $360 a year for the average uh, water user. 
Um, in, in these different colors here, the red is the total bill. There was no debt service charge. What we had, all we have is a, a user charge, which is the blue line. And then green is that base charge. And then as we as we started to grow the infrastructure and fix some of the problems, um, that's when the debt service charge came in. You could see the the slow, well, almost it was an immediate jump to rates, but then it kind of steadied out for a while uh, until now we hit this PFAS problem. Um, and then by by we're projecting by 2024. And you can, you can see the debt service charge of the bill is, is more than the usage fee just because we're borrowing so much money. But in 2024, that shoots up to $850 a year. And if you compare that to today with, with average water bills, it's in line, but it's not what our community is used to. This community is very used to having low water rates. And some of them pride themselves in for a long time. Um, They're not MWR, MWRA rates, but you're right. It's just people have a historic sure. reference. Right. And that's a 136% increase over the, over the 11 years. Um, and, you know, the, the, the borrowing is beneficial to all the residents, all the users. Um, but it's going to cost money, you know, and that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, we're already starting to hear now the the concerns from the residents that the water rates are high and what I'm fearful of this is kind of the beginning I and mean, this is it's only gonna get worse if you know, do the, the bar that we have in front of us is it um, too speculative for me to look at 2023 and 24 and see that leveling off or is that too far out to, yeah, it's too far so you're saying that you're saying after after these yeah I mean it, you <coughs> see a, a meaningful increase from 2020 to 20 23 and then 2020 <coughs> 2024 maybe I mean I mean the good news is you know Beaverbrook treatment plant at that point will be you know 13 years old 13 years old yeah, yeah not quite 10 or 11 10 11 um spec bond's gone so that we don't put any money in there Wickham Ave will be brand new at that point um storage tanks will be in good shape so now you just talk about mains which is the price tag to that, but it's not overly expensive, depending on how you approach it. Um, and now you're just really looking at source water acquisition. So yeah, if we do Cobbs, if we do Nagog, then there's money there, but if, if for whatever reason those don't happen, they should level off. Well, the X fact has always been the DEP, DEP regulations. They can change, you know. So there's, a, there's, a, there's another contaminant after PFAS? Yeah, and you know it's coming, yeah. but. Uh, they, they cost us a lot of money, and, and some of that 11-year uh, uh, climb, climb is, is definitely uh, um, DEP-mandated driven uh, um, fixes that we have to put on our system to m remain uh, uh, compliant. So a lot of that hike is that, and then we can't say what's going to happen. That we're way out for 2024, <clears throat> so we don't know. Um. So I guess at this point, I just kind of want to touch base on the projects that are really driving that cost. Um, and we're kind of in the middle of some of these, and some of them kind of tie together. So it's, I know it's confusing. It's confusing for us, never mind uh, the residents in town. Uh, but we already have two bonding authorizations. One was for the original Wickham Ave treatment plan for $7 million. That was in, uh, I believe, Springtown meeting in 2018. And then in the fall, last fall, we went for the uh, PFAST infrastructure. Uh, barring authorization and that was the one that was tied to the article 97 destination swap at Wickham Ave uh, so we've already been authorized 13 million dollars we haven't spent hardly any of it um, we just run a million or yeah not even a million not even a million dollars because uh, we haven't really done anything yet other than we we had a hundred percent design on Wickham Ave treatment plant but then um, there was litigation that slowed that down uh, and then PFAS, we're, you know, that we're really just starting on that now. We're out to bid right now on a temporary <coughs> pipeline that comes in on the 24th. Uh, that, that once in that project can start rolling after that. Uh, we don't have final numbers yet, but we're, we're, what we had told town meeting in the fall was we we're looking at another $10 million to complete Wickham Ave. And by complete, what I mean is add in PFAS treatment to that treatment plant, but also expand it to take in additional water of Spec Pond. Um, and also, it needs a transmission main between those two facilities. 
Uh, some of that we can fit under the six million, but some of that will be outside that six million. Uh, and there's things that you know, again, that you know, myself and Chris Starr have been talking about uh, ways that we can help each other with the roads and with the main to help keep those costs down. And essentially, what Nick is saying, Spec Pond Road. You know, if if that's on your roadmap, um, maybe it's time to take a look at that once we start Wickham Ave to get that source from Spectacle Pond down to Wickham Ave to the treatment plant possibly with your roads and we can work together cohesively and get two projects done um, at the same time so it's gonna I mean we're still early um, but it's coming fast you know we're, we're hoping to have the um, final design done late late summer, summer. for which one uh, Wickham no, uh, yeah, probably fall, early fall. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, that pipeline is separate of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, that that should be earlier. Right? Yeah. yeah, the pipeline will probably be final design mid-summer, okay. early summer. <laughs> so, again, I, mean, I don't know where Spec Pond Road is on your your roads plan. Uh, Chris said it's number one. <laughs> Chris is back there. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris is here. Just jumped up Moving on the up list. There, buddy. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a it was a couple of years out, but we can always juggle some things. Is there any uh, discussion right now of providing municipal water to some of the folks, not exactly on Spec Pond, but on some of the roads off of Spec Pond, instead of having them on uh, private drinking water? As soon as we have that infrastructure in place, Chase, I That's think. That's the rate limiting stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually, there's part of the temp uh, blending solution is to get some newer infrastructure from Beaverbrook to Lawrence Street, Lawrence Lawrence Street, Street that there is no infrastructure to bring more residents in town on our water system so um, to answer your question yes uh, and then the one project that probably no one in this room has heard yet is the Cedar Hill storage tank replacement uh, that's 50% designed right now we've already reached out to the, the neighborhoods out there to have some meetings and discussions that that storage tank was was supposed to be replaced before uh, Sunny Delight left. And then Sunny Delight left, um, and it was put on hold um, until that building got replaced again. And, and DEP required uh, us to do structural and, uh, engineering analysis on the tank every three years, um, and we just completed one, and that tank is ready to be replaced. How old is that actual tank? That's ancient, right? 40s? Mm -hmm. I think it was 52, maybe, that it was finished. 1950. 50. Okay. We had to go to the Historical Commission and take it down. <laughs> <laughs> um, Just keep one wallet. <laughs> uh, some of the good news with that project is we, were, we did acquire that corner lot um, probably five years ago. So we can actually build the new tank while keeping the existing tank online and do a, a slow methodical replacement because uh, that does house all the uh, public safety uh, antennas and, and radio system and uh, uh, some other private carriers as well. Um, but that project, we're, we're going to be hopefully coming forward in the spring looking for that bonding authorization to move that project forward. And again, I, I, I don't ever want to lose sight of, of our future project, which are our, our new source acquisitions because it's, it's a it's it's imperative that this community finds new water at some point. Uh, again, we've covered it through our operating budget, uh, but at some point we're going to have to set money aside to, to bring those sources online. Part of the discussions that I've had with Chairman Knox has been um, some, you know, this is a town issue. It's not a water issue. It's not a, a selectman issue. It's, a, it's a really a town issue where we really need to um, work together, I think, to try and help the uh, residents to try and keep that spike maybe bring it down and part of the conversations that have been in lieu of taxes we've tried we did that when we replaced the main on Goldsmith Street so I'd like to ask the board uh, if we can get a subgroup together possibly just to talk about these specific um, projects and you know if there's a way yes or no a combined uh, funding you know um, so I'd be willing to sit I I, I know the commissioners um, we really haven't 
designated anybody, but we'll talk about it at our next meeting. If if you would be inclined to do so, I think communications, that's all we're looking for. Just don't. I know we get at least one FinCon member here, but they probably should be in that loop as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And just, just keep those lines of communications open. And uh, I'd ask that, you know, you guys make an appointment also. Well, I, I can see that happening. It's money's tight all around. So yep. we'll have to I agree. come up with some original funding ideas. Like all, all the money makers are like water projects, but when they're expenses, then it's a town project. I've well, noticed it's, that. It's, you know, it's funny you say that, Paul. <laughs> um, it's... Uh, it's above and beyond any normal project. Right, look, I'm on board. You know I'm what just, I'm saying? Just hey, noticing. This is, I know, I know. This is this is unusual circumstances. You know, of course. the perfect storm, so to speak. Yeah. So, um, I think it'd be be best for all of us to uh, try and work together. Bad Nick. Do a big sale. Yeah. <laughs> Big bake sale. Big bake sale. I just, I, I could, I just had a question regarding, so just quickly on the water. Um, so you, you have a, a pretty healthy enterprise, about like, I guess you're free cash, like 17% of your budget. You have it's free cash. Has there been any discussion to control where your debt service is now starting, is outpacing your usage? Is that expected to never end? Or are you trying to get through? I mean, because this only goes up to 24, and it's clearly. Yeah. outpacing your usage so are you have you thought about using some of your uh, free cash to pay down that debt service to bridge the gap that's well we, we haven't bonded Sir, can you identify yourself please <laughs> yeah uh, Gary Wilson chairman of FinCom one Wilson Lane Wilson thank you we haven't bonded a lot of these projects yet uh, sir we're just covering it right now with short-term bans gotcha. um, when, when we go to bond these projects if we have excess free cash will absolutely use that money before we go and bond for it. Um, but we won't know that answer until the time comes to actually bond for the for the projects. So this is that's what these this forecast out to twenty four is kind of predicted of the bonding. Yes. That that's assuming we bond everything. Yeah. Which I don't think we will because I, I think you're right, our free cash is a little bit higher than No, it's healthy. In Littleton in general we have a healthy free cash. We were talking about that as well. So but, but I, I, I think, think we use it to bridge a gap in that debt, so try to pay that debt service down yeah. during a period of. But I think the Chase's point. I think if we can get zero percent financing, yeah, then right. you know, then maybe you know, it's a board discussion. But maybe we, you know, bond the projects, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then maybe fund it out of that free cash. But yeah. uh, we haven't got to that level yet because we don't know what we're up against as right. far as bonding. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's all I really had on the on the, the water department financials and projects. So before we switch gears to sewer, I don't know if there's any. Do you have any meaningful decommissioning costs of the spec bond treatment plan, or is that sort of a rounding error? Around the we haven't even looked into that one yet. <laughs> Unplug. That's that's not it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's turn that's the lights good off. I turn just, the lights off. Just it's curiosity. a very complicated building. <laughs> I got some. So, with Chris's help, we come up with kind of a prioritization of which roads we're looking at. And I'm sure that you guys have, have worked to see what kind of overlap there is there. Yep. You guys have that similar type of list. Like, these are the Russell Street, for instance. Yep. So always, there's always a, a main break on Russell Street, right, Kevin? And, uh, Pretty soon, we'll be all couplings. We'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to go. <laughs> um, you guys have that, you know, a list like that that. Yep. Yeah, we're sharing that. Okay, just to try to. If we know when we're doing our prioritization sure. of which roads need to be done, if we know what your yeah, we we is, don't where we we can expect there we to don't be have some many. failures. You know, we don't. Our list is short. Um, it's That's more good. it's more important to see Chris's list because there might be some mains that we you know we wouldn't really replace. But if Chris is going to do a road, maybe it does make sense for us to replace the main. Chicken on the egg bag, you know. Just yeah, sure that exactly. Yeah, the important thing is that Chris and Kevin communicate on, on those type of projects, and, the, and they are. So I think we're in good hands there. Okay, moving on. Ready for sewer? All right. Uh, so this is the sewer budget that we put together for the Board of Water Commissioners uh, for last meeting. 
There really never was a sewer budget before. Um, it was kind of just a line item in the town but in the town budget to cover sewer costs. So I, I look back historically through uh, what those costs were and try to come up with a budget that actually makes sense so we can track, you know, what to the... Be, to be clear for people listening, this is our existing, existing sewer yes. network, yep. right? Yep. Yep. Um, so I, I think it's a slight increase over what's been carried in the town uh, budget historically, and I, and I think, um, you know, there's a few reasons for that, obviously, but... You know, at some point we need to start building our sewer enterprise fund to run the sewer department like a sewer department. Um, it, it was our thoughts start July 1st, and we sat, me and Erica Rooks sat down with Nina and Cheryl to start building this like a sewer rate and not just have it a line item, but, you know, the schools, uh, the fire department, whoever's connected will actually get a sewer bill. Uh, it'll probably be on the, on the water bill in the beginning, um, so that way you actually, you know, pay for your usage. Um, True utility. As a, as a utility. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. So that's the direction the Board of Water Commissioners have given us. Um, we, and we started those conversations with Nina and Cheryl to, to make sure the budgets on their end could cover those costs. And um, really the scary part for us has been if a pump goes down, if something breaks, we're responsible for it. What happens? You know, so in the past, it was the town responsibility where you're much bigger than us. We're very small. So that's really what this is all about. Well, yeah, I mean, and there's zero, there's zero dollars in the Sioux Enterprise Fund to cover anything. Yeah. That's a right that now. Too. <clears throat> Just to add to this section, I mean, the discussion that we had this weekend was to um, manage any capital requests that come in to us as a separate mm -hmm. item, uh, but, you know, that's subject to further discussion by the board if the board wishes to discuss it. Then. Yeah, I, th I think one of our, one of the things we kicked around with respect to the budgets going forward is that we, if the goal here is to set some money aside to pay for that could ultimately be used for the town's liability with respect to the, it's called the new sewer versus the current sewer. Just to, to, to offset some of the town's liability with respect to the new sewer, I think the, the position was we, we might want to just defer that and do it as one comprehensive um, package going forward. Um, what we didn't discuss was do we need to set some money aside. I think the the delta was eighty seven thousand dollars. Does that sound right? I think that was the high end of what was end. presented when um, Nick met Nick and um, Erica, Cheryl, and I met. Okay. Back um, what was it? A month ago, maybe. Yeah, probably a month ago. That was the high end that was presented. But um, what we didn't discuss is does it make sense to set aside a smaller amount right now, understanding that we're deferring certain maintenance on the current system. Mm -hmm that we hope to offset with the comprehensive new system and so we're we're deferring some of those liabilities and i think I, I don't know where that discussion needs to happen if it needs to happen at the between nick and cheryl and nina or if it needs to happen at the board level or or where but there's a, a reflection of priorities there and a reflection of timing that we need to get our heads around um particularly because i think the Finance Committee and the Board of Selectmen <coughs> is essentially interested in deferring the capital costs until the whole thing for the new system is clear. So if there's some middle ground. So you're talking capital issues or are the operational piece that the... It sort of fell in a weird place. I mean, we, we actually looked at it as a capital cost, um, even because it's new, right? Like the, the Delta is new and it... We had this discussion. It's actually an operational cost, right? It's it's our normal utilities. Um, the way the location it showed up in our budget, at least for this coming year, was actually as a capital number. Uh, I think in the long run we need to we need to move that over into the operational sure. side. Mine and Cheryl did a lot of work this year to make sure things were in the right places, and that's one that I think may still be orphaned. Gotcha. Minor clarification. I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it showed up in our operating, but our understanding of what was presented was the fact that there is no 
dollars there's nothing available if something does go wrong so that's that's the perspective of having to you know repair something or otherwise potentially being a capital so item true capital expense I right gotcha. right so that's kind of how that connection occurred gotcha. yeah i guess before in years past the sewer line item always had the town behind it to fund if something was to happen now it's an enterprise fund and there's nothing behind it the sewer department is behind the sewer department and there's zero dollars in the, in the budget in the bank no income so yeah. i think that was i think that was the board's concerns when they asked me to put this budget together um we can do a line item transfer, is right? there a way that the town can continue to commit to backstopping that for the short term before july 1st yes. before what what about after july 1st yeah, yeah it would be a subsidy basically if an issue came up or even tomorrow, alone, it could be structures alone too on future revenues couldn't it i suppose yeah yeah, yeah cheryl's nodding us yeah because eventually there'll be a revenue stream there. Yeah. <laughs> because that, if the town was, if the town committed to backstopping that, I, I think that would meet everybody's objectives, right? You know, it, it really doesn't change the, the structure as it's been. It uh, looks different on paper, but the operation is the same. I don't know what the right process to, to doing that would be, though. We can send you a bill. <laughs> Show up in your water bill. Oh, well, you can put anything you want in my water bill. Well, and I think the scenario changes significantly if, um, if and when we have a larger sewer system. That Absolutely. you know that 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 model doesn't work at that point. But right, and I, I guess that the town backstopping the current uh, current potential capital issues is a a bridge until we get to the new Absolutely. system. Absolutely right. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And in, in fact, I think we've had it established that all the costs we've incurred to date, borrowings, engineers, you name it, can all be back back paid by the uh, revenue stream in the future. I mean, if we that you know, I'm not sure what that does to the books and all, but I know uh, um, you know they had actually factored that into the financial modeling before too. So additional costs before we get the new sewer up and running can be can be loaned or you know at least paid back in some form and then certainly once we get to the point where the <coughs> CDM is comfortable with the financials you guys are comfortable f with the financials if we need a little duct tape and bubble gum to keep the current system running that's what we do right yeah you still need the flush here <laughs> the schools the fire department indeed indeed we gotta hook the light department up to that's what we need to do <laughs> You're yeah, right. We just replaced our we're septic. Yeah, we're <laughs> you're absolutely correct. All in due time. So I mean, I guess it was our intention of bringing a sewer budget forward as a town meeting vote. Now that's an enterprise fund, similar to how we do the water department. So I mean, is that the direction we're still going under? Yeah. So the vote was specific that the sewer enterprise fund does not start until July 1st. So you right. can't actually bring a sewer enterprise fund at, in May as a, as a vote unless it's for perspective going forward. Post, yeah. makes post sense. July 1. Right. Yeah. 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 We can fund yeah. it with yeah. contingency, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Make it effective as of July 1st. Sure. Right. Sure. It in May and make it effective as yeah. July 1. Sure. Yep. Yeah. So hopefully anything breaks between now and June thirtieth, then we're sounds good. <laughs> anything else on those financials? <laughs> so just so this budget, we we level funded from our previous budget, correct? Is that right? At one thirteen. So this is a discussion that next week, I think, uh, we'll have to have. Because there's twenty, there's a twenty-two thousand dollar gap that we didn't discuss on Saturday. Sure. But now that I see this number, so sure. it's not a huge thing, but we we will have to add that to our. We we'll have to finalize. I guess discussion. our votes on yeah. Monday yeah. and Tuesday next week. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I, had, you know, I, I thought maybe this would be a good opportunity. I, I think most people in this room are probably up to speed with the sewer project, but maybe people in the audience at home might not be. Uh, we did just send out a letter. Uh, so we, we have the sewer working group, which consists of um, water department staff, myself, Nina, uh, uh, Paul and Chase, and Bruce and Dickey. Um, and George Sanders from the public is, is on it as well. Uh, we sent out a letter to residents updating. It, it had been a while since uh, really fall town meeting, and a lot had happened, but uh, there had been no update um, sent out, so we, we figured it'd be a good opportunity to update it on everybody. Um, you know, as we said in the letter, we've hired CDM Smith to do a peer review of, of Western and Sampson's engineering. And they're looking at three major criteria. They're looking at the, um, the discharge site, so the Littleton High School, to make sure that the site itself is, is engineeringly sound um, to handle the, the discharge of the new system. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be any concerns about that, but they thought it would be good practice to, to review it and make sure it's a sound site. Uh, they're also looking at the site analysis that was done uh, to site the actual uh, facility, the treatment plant itself. Um, there hasn't been many comments back on that yet, but you know, we're looking forward to seeing what they see there. And they're also looking at the financials. So I think we've heard uh, from day one there was concerns about the financials. Our board had a concern about the financials. So they're going to look at the financials of the project to make sure that those are sound. Um, that report's due back to us in draft form. Uh, February 20th or something like that, and then finalized by the end of February. Once we have that finalized report, that will define what the next steps are for the project. Um, so the working group will see that first. We'll be able to to hash out uh, anything that we any issues we see with it. It'll, then it'll be finalized in in you know, a public document for review. Uh, what one thing that the working group worked on right away was the Mass Works grant. Uh, we were able to restructure that with the state so that now covers uh, just the discharge site itself. We kind of reworked the project with them. The state was very, very good to work with on that project. And the home petition uh, got sent. And the excuse me, yeah. the mass work is 1.2? 1.5. 1.5. So uh, that's, that's, a nice, that's a nice hit for us to make sure that discharge site is. It should, and it should cover the, the total cost of the discharge site. Is what it looks like it'll cover. Um, so when we go to do that, there'll be no cost to the town to, to redo the discharge site. That's where the current discharge site is now, which is, is important to mention. Does, yeah. uh, and I guess the final piece impact to mention beyond the, the financial impact, though, there is, is, there is, is impact. Yeah. Uh, the home rule petition was filed last week. The amended home rule petition. So. Uh, Rep. Osiro is, is, has that, and, and uh, they're working on getting that through the legislative process. Just mm -hmm. uh, uh, Yeah, I was recently told by um, uh, our legislative delegation that the petitions get filed by the representative. So just FYI. Speaking of Rep. Osiro, he. Um, he filed the home rule petition for a Wickhamath treatment plant, uh, which was which was great. Uh, even after he got letters from the abutters' lawyers telling him not to file it, um, he listened to the will of town meeting, um, which was 95% telling him to file the legislation. Uh, so we're very appreciative of, of Rep. Arcero uh, filing that. Uh, Corey and I have been in meeting after meeting after meeting about this project. Uh, you know, the local ones, I think we all know how the local meetings have gone. They've all gone uh, very well. Uh, we met with DEP a couple weeks ago, finally, again. Uh, they're very supportive of the project. And, and last week we met with um, EEA, which is really the, the, the state body that decides or recommends to the legislative, legislatures how to proceed with this. Uh, it was a very productive meeting, and they're behind the project 100%. Um, and they're going to work with Rep. Arcero to get this through as fast as they can. There should be no reason why this doesn't come out uh, of this session. Corey left smiling. I haven't seen Corey smile in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's smiling. Uh, some of the things that we could do with this project that we, we've been doing, you know, we, we've been taking as many steps forward as we can. Uh, the highway garage is down. 
you know, off that parcel of land that uh, that, that you folks had, had given to us. Um, EA was thrilled with with the progress of that of that site. I mean, it's a very important piece of land uh, to the town to restore to its natural state. Uh, we put the replacement wells in, so all the wells are now in. Uh, and the next thing we're doing, which probably become in, kind of tying online in the fall, would be tying those wells into the system. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work, manifold work, that has to happen. It's going to happen inside that brick building that's still there. Um, that will be happening in the fall, which is good because that increases the capacity. Because if you remember correctly, I think I told you guys a couple years ago, these wells uh, aren't producing what the withdrawal permit allows them to produce because they're just deranged. So I think they get four, 425 gallons per minute. The withdrawal permit 600. These new wells will be able to get 600 gallons per minute, uh, which, which which that's what the permit allows us to get. And, and you take the old wells just off then? With yeah. the, they're at the same location? They're roughly the same, yeah, they're within 50 yeah. feet. Yeah, yeah. they're 10 feet away from each other. Yeah. yeah. So that sounds like a lot of water, but <coughs> You got Patriot Beverage that's slowly ramping up here, so um, you're going to see that, you know, increase usage there also. And there's a lot of new homes, as you guys know, in this town. Um, so, you know, you know, one one thing I wanted to mention um, was we're getting a lot of dirty water complaints now, especially from this area. Um, and that Ivan issues. <laughs> <laughs> we don't count Ivans. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that it's kind of it's twofold. Um, spec ponds offline, uh, which means we have to use these these wells more. Uh, but it, we need a treatment plan here, which we've been working with the community now for a while. Um, it's just unfortunate that we've had abutters that have put up a fight and um, have slowed this process down. But um, to be clear, the complaints are taste, odor, aesthetic issues, not true drinking water quality issues. Is that right? Yeah, the iron and manganese yeah. issues, yeah. Okay. yeah. Iron and manganese is not uh, aesthetic anymore. Iron and manganese is an MCL, so it's, <coughs> it's, a, that, it's, it's wrong. It's a, uh, it's a water quality problem. Right. Okay. I'm glad you're not answering the phone. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, these, these people in, the, in, the, in this part of town have been waiting for this plan for a long time. They're emotional about it, um, and, and now the water's getting worse, and they all know why the plant's not being built, so they're tough calls to take. Um, anything else on Wickham? Who mows that? Hmm? Who mows that, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> no natural state. Um, if you haven't driven by or seen it, take a drive by and it's, it's nice. <clears throat> Such a nice building. That's, yeah. It's nice to see that big old, you know, garage, garage going, gone. that That's asbestos cool. garage I saw, exactly. So one of the things when we were at the Mass Municipal Association conference, a lot of discussion about climate resiliency and um, climate change resiliency. And it, I'm not sure if the public understands exactly how this isn't you know, part of the MVP program specifically, but how this broadly fits into that, right? We're, we're, we're taking something from an area that's immediately adjacent to wetlands and we're moving it upland. Uh, I'm glad you said that, Chick. I wouldn't say broadly, and in fact, the EP had mentioned to us that this might fit the MVP grant. Oh, really? So, oh, um, So if and when we ever get to build this project, we'll be looking at that avenue okay. as, as a funding source. Uh, but you're right, it fits it very well. So I guess the next part of the presentation was really the, the landfill slash PFAS. I don't know if... Do you want to open up to the Board of Health now? Are they here? Yep, back there, some of them are anyway. Jim's here. Jim's here. There's a few members here. Are we ready to get into it? Sure. Sure. All right. I'm not sure what time. I assume they posted at 6.45, but I admittedly didn't check. Do you know what time the Board of Health was posted at 6.45? Should we invite the Board of Health up? Sure. Yeah. Yes, join us if you like. <coughs> Plenty of laps. Or just pull more chairs over, too. <coughs> Scooch in. Scoochy, scoochy. 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 Scoochy, scoochy.
That's better, Jim. Well, that's what it means. You really are. That's what you know. Good morning. Thanks. Another chance to form and say hi. Uh, so, I mean, this is really the point of the presentation where I start to get over my head a little bit. So, if Corey starts kicking me, that just means I'm misspeaking. This is really his, this is his area. But, um, you know, I'll give it a shot. The, you know, the area in question, a couple of things, you know, the area, the watershed that the landfill is in, but also where we found PFAS is, uh, was in the Spec Pond watershed. But it's, it's part of what's called the Bennett's Brook watershed, which is shown on this map outlined in red. Um, you know, as you can see, it's a, it's a very residential watershed, um, with the exception of right in the middle where, where there's a, a fair amount of industry. Um, you know, but it's, it's a watershed that we, that we feel pretty comfortable uh, with our ability to protect and find contamina contamination uh, sites. Uh, if you zoom in a little bit further on the Spec Pond watershed, um, you know, that's it right there. <coughs> And there's a few things that we wanted to point out with this. Uh, you know, one being, if you look at this, there's three larger circles there. Those, those are air and our public water supplies. So they're right in the middle of this watershed. Uh, but there's also quite a, quite a bit of uh, private wells. So all those little circles are private wells in that watershed. It's about 80 or so. To the best of our knowledge, and I don't think we have a great list anywhere in town of where all the private wells are. Uh, how we how we got this list was cross-referencing electric accounts and water accounts and assume if you know if they didn't have a water company had an electric account they probably had a private well so it's not foolproof way of trying to find them but it's it's our best guess of where the private wells are um, in in this area so it's 80 we had that's where, that represents about 15 percent of the private wells in in Littleton um, no, but again, uh, Spec Pond and Air are both in that watershed, and both have found uh, levels of PFAS over the proposed standard uh, that's off of comment right now of 20 parts per trillion. So I, I just got a quick question for the Board of Health. Are, I know private wells have to come through the Board of Health. Yeah. And is there any, does Neshoba have a, a historical document or any type of data on Walls in town? So each file, each street file, um, has the well records that we have, both the permitting location and any water testing information we would have are in the street files upstairs. In the okay. Right. Jim, do you mind identifying yourself with the crowd at large? Sure. Jim Gareffi, I'm the health agent from the Shober for the uh, Board of Health. Jim, uh, this is what tests for private wells. Do they have to test uh, over a period of time, or is that just one test when it was put in? When, when the well gets drilled, it gets tested. Okay. And yes. then, again, it's that. It. Nobody likes to hear it, but it is a private water supply, so it really is the responsibility <coughs> of the private well owner to do the testing from time to time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important. Um, another piece of context, I guess, for, for this part of the conversation is um, you know, I think you all remember at fall town meeting, uh, Corey and I presented on this, um, and we got, even though we wanted to borrow $6 million and we're looking to remove Article 97 designation on our land, a lot of the questions, if not the majority of them, were from private well owners saying, what about us? Sure. Because they were, they were concerned about the same things that our, that our residents that are connected to our system are concerned about. And I think majority of the questions were, what do we do and how do we do it? Uh, and that's when, uh, you know, the, the, the commissioner said, listen, we won't pay for you, but we will give you your guidance and tell you where to go to get your water tested to enable to see what's happening in your well. And that's essentially what we have done. Yeah. If somebody comes to us, comes to Corey, and says, how do I do this? He gives his expertise in regards to how to take a sample, where to send the sample, mm -hmm. And if they have questions in regards to what the sample means or the results mean, they can ask Corey. So that's that's a, the extent of what we did or have been doing for those folks that actually have come to us. Yeah. And How many have there been? There's 10 or 11 just in this watershed right here. Yeah. Um, which is, our, that's all we offer the assistance to. Cause that's the only watershed that we um, operate under that has PFAS in the water. Um, and. And there's, there's a document that we work with with the private well owners, the DP approved, that 
allows this to happen. Because once you take this test, that needs to be reported to DEP. It's a public record because we've seen it. Um, you know, so there's, there's there's a lot of um, things that are worked out before that test is actually taken. Um, so what the way the way we protect all of our uh, the watersheds in our in our in our town is through a groundwater monitoring testing program. Uh, this was put in place in 1981. Uh, Savis was was behind this. Uh, we have about 100 monitoring wells throughout. Our, our town um, and they're all tied to, uh, to industrial commercial properties uh, and, and they're used to measure contaminants that might come out of those properties into the watershed um, you know we, we test these annually um, and we test them and we compare those results and we test for contaminants that are on the drinking water uh, standards list um, so we take those tests if there's an issue um, you know, we're comparing it to the current standards, we're comparing it to hist historical trends to make sure that this, something's not creeping or moving um, to a, a level that would alarm us because maybe you could mitigate it against before there was an issue. Um, and then depending on what we find, you know, there's things that happen. So we, well, most of the time it's nothing, no action required because everything's within um, standards and nothing's moving and everything's good. Uh, sometimes it might require more frequent sampling. You know, instead of, instead of doing it once a year, maybe do it twice a year. Um, on some instances, it might require an audit by by Corey, environmental audit, to see if there's something you know obvious that's leading to it or, or, or what the issues are. Um, and then on times that it exceeds an MCL, a mass contaminant level, uh, there's DEP notification that's required. Are, are all of those monitoring wells in potential drinking water source areas? Or are they? They're all yeah, they're all within the. Zone they're associated <laughs> with the aquifer and water resource zoning districts, okay. so their the monitoring requirements are spilled out in the special permit for those for those locations. <clears throat> um, one thing that Nick didn't say was we haven't tested for PFAS. You know, so this is new to us, new to the town. Uh, you know, it's 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 been I don't want to it's been an issue, I'd say in the Midwest earlier, but it's slowly just spreading out throughout the entire country. Um, part and the commissioners have said part of our annual testing will be PFAS moving forward in all our monitoring walls. We have it, we know it. We got to make sure we know where it is. Right. And, and for, to further that statement, um, in the vote that was made that Jim's mentioning, it was it was to test by the end of February all the monitoring wells in, in the spec pond uh, watershed for PFAS because that's what we have. It. Um, so you, this is the, this is um, again the spec pond watershed with our monitoring wells on there, um, and there's 11 monitoring wells that are on there. Um, and then there's the also the blue dots are, are private wells from the area that we've already tested that have worked with us uh, to get their water tested. And, and then Corey, on this, when he did this map, he, he placed the industries that, that are tied to those monitoring wells so you can see them. Uh, the air industrial park is not in under our control. Um, and I believe the town of Air is working on the DEP on testing that site there as well. Do we need to notify any of the uh, DEP on our wells in town for monitoring? Say that again. Does DEP have to be notified for any of our wells in the in, the area? in our district? They don't have to be, but they they asked to be, and so we sent them that information. Would it be appropriate for the town to just notify people that have those wells, even though they're 100 feet away from each other? You know, they need to have it tested. You know, there's a courtesy when you send them a bill for the electric. Send, send them a letter like, you know, have, have your water test once a year. That way they have an idea, you know what I mean, what to do. I think we it, had that in one of our mailers. Yeah, one of the mailers we did that, sends, that we send to all residents, we yeah. did stipulate if you have a private well to reach out thank you yeah that's right 
Uh, so, so I guess the extent of testing that needs to happen in the spec pond watershed uh, isn't a lot. You know, there's, there's, again, it's, it's kind of a, it's a very small, it's a sub watershed of the larger one, but it's very small, uh, and there's not that much industry in there, so it's not a huge ask as long as it doesn't snow a lot um, to to get to these wells and, and grab samples. Um, you know, the landfill, of course, is five of those uh, wells and is inside the watershed. Um, you know, and it was part of, of the Board of Water Commission's direction to test those as well for PFAS and um, other drinking water contaminants. So I guess my question with the landfill was, um, I fully expect, with respect to the landfill, the Mass DEP, as, as we bring that into compliance, and there's already some testing, non-PFAS-related testing with it, um, fully expect Mass DEP to have us <coughs> test those wells for PFAS. Um, it would be completely consistent with what every other state is doing. You know, California tiered their sites, landfills were on the top. New York tiered their sites, landfills were on the top. Um, my question is, could we do that? PFAS testing is part of the compliance program and bringing the landfill up to um, up to snuff with mass DDP. Um, part of the reason I'd like to do it as part of the comprehensive landfill response is that there are some other things that we need to deal with with respect to the landfill, and I think it makes it, um, first of all, much cleaner as far as mass DEP is concerned to have all of the data arrive at one time. They're focusing on one story rather than the PFAS story with the landfill and then some of the other compliance things with the landfill. Um, the other element of that is that I think there's potentially other testing, not just groundwater testing, that is going to be expected with respect to the landfill. So just in terms of a data quality thing, I, I would rather see a comprehensive set of data taken at one point in time associated with the landfill um, rather than the PFAS samples out of context of all of the other sampling. Um, as we bring it into compliance and work with the solid waste division. Um, my expectation is that the, is that mass DEP will want that sooner rather than later. Um, in fact, I would be surprised if they don't want it promptly and on the same time frame. I, I just don't want to do it, I, I don't want to do it one step, one little bit at a time. So. <coughs> My response would be, and, that, and your points are very well taken, uh, my response would be that uh, it's almost like we can't unknow something we already know. And information and, uh, and public education is the first thing we do over on over in water. So if we know there's a potential problem and we know that the public is interested in this thing and we know that we're the stewards of uh, health and, and, and health and well-being of uh, everyone who drinks water, including uh, those who have uh, private wells, which uh, uh, nationally the EPA wants you all to change to uh, to town water state. Um, the DEP wants it. We at the board want it. Water department wants it. Everybody should be drinking. I mean, I can put a glass of water in front of you as a homeowner that has your own private well. One will kill you. One doesn't. You can't tell. It has to be tested. It has to be tested. Um, systematically, periodically, um, on on time, and that leads right into the PFAS is coming up. It's on our it's on our boards. We know it. It's a monster out there. It's it's waiting. If we can and we can, we're going to sample it now. We're going to get the education that we need to the public. They're going to make their own decisions, and it's better for them to have. We're the only department in town that has a full time environmental analyst. Right. And when you have an environmental analyst, I don't know if, if, if everyone knows what that means, but he comes fully accredited with all of the, uh, the background he needs to, to sort out this mess. Um, not only that, but we've hired um, a nationally based uh, um, engineering firms to help us make these decisions. So if anybody is going to make a decision in this town, we feel pretty well equipped to say uh, the latest, greatest of what's going on, what the people need to know. We're going to stand behind um, <clears throat> early education and early knowledge to the people. I don't even like to use Flint, Michigan, but uh, 
transparency is our is our uh, is our uh, company credo. You know that's uh, that's our culture over there, and uh, we're going to stick with it. So um, I do understand your 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 question, and, and it is very viable. But as far as our answer goes, um, we know there's a possibility. We know there's a public out there that wants to have some answers. We know we're the right people to give that answer, and we're going to move forward with it as fast as we can to educate them so they can start making decisions on their own as to uh, what they don't know, what they need to know, whatever, and they can come and talk to us. Anybody out there can come and talk to us at, at Light and Water. Uh, Corey's a, uh, an exceptional um, uh, a resource. So how, how does knowing the data with respect to the, the wells around the landfill change public knowledge with respect to PFAS and <coughs> our response to public health? With well, that's going to help PFAS. us. It, it takes a while. Fingerprinting is a, is a thing that we, we do, and uh, it takes a while to get all that information in, and then once you get that information in, it has to be, um, it has to be looked at, and, uh, and, and, and um, you have to pull out it's just raw data. To turn that raw data into something you can work with is a time-consuming process. So the faster we get the raw data into the into the process, the faster we'll come out with a real answer for everybody, which is really all we're looking for. Mm -hmm. I think to your point, though, Chase, um, I know the town has been working with DEP in regards to coming into compliance. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are we close to being in compliance at this point from last discussions, Chris? Any help? Um, yeah, the, the final report should be submitted to EDP this week. We will then sit down meeting to discuss the results of that report. So, in regards to being in compliance, as you said, Chase, uh, uh, preliminarily, uh, from your professional standpoint and knowing what's what's happened. Um, What's the what's the response been from DEP? Compliance-wise, um, we're doing what DEP told us to do. I mean, I don't know if there's any de official definition of being in compliance. Okay. Um, we're taking the steps that DEP is requiring. And, and I guess my expectation, taking a look at the data, is DEP is going to want some follow-up sampling, some follow-up testing, and potentially some response actions. To address some uh, some some remedies associated with what's going on with the, sure. with the landfill, um, in particular, there's some water quality issues right on the edge of the landfill, the the wells to the north, uh, which suggests possibly impacts in Bennett's Brook. So there could be some sediment sampling associated with that, and certainly some follow-up monitoring of those wells, as well as coming into compliance means not just a one round of testing but now what's it's a semi-annual program is that yeah right? the groundwater monitoring is semi-annual gas monitoring is quarterly um going back to to my question the, the reason i ask about what do we do with the data and how does knowing that data protect public health is because the the wells around the landfill and it i do take this very very seriously and i'm not advocating that we um don't test other wells, and I'm not advocating that we don't rule out the ability to test other wells to the public. I think it's justifiable for the landfill to move on on the landfill's um, time frame, as long as it's not unreasonable, right? You know, if it's six months or nine months out where we get that data, that, that's reasonable to me. The reason that makes sense to me is because those wells, first of all, are in an area where we know broadly that there's PFAS impacts. Um, so. Finding PFAS there wouldn't be surprising, but we already know it's there. Um, second of all, it's it's in the zone two for airs drinking water wells. Um, they know they have PFAS. They're working on responding to it. So knowing what the concentrations are around our landfill doesn't change that story right now. And, and lastly, it's well outside of the zone one of any other drinking water source. So I, I just don't see how knowing the data <coughs> around the landfill with respect to PFAS, why getting ahead on just the PFAS question helps us respond to human health concerns with respect to PFAS. When we're going to go get the data anyway, and we're going to get a better, frankly, a better quality data set when we do the whole thing comprehensively paired with 
other analyses paired with whatever DEP wants us to do as far as follow-up sampling. Um, and and not, not putting our head in the sand, but putting the landfill on its compliance track. I think the next slide will, will show us that, you know, w the sampling that has been done, um, you know, if, and you know better than I, this is your profession, uh, it's not a good, it's not a good read. Um, so I, I, I understand what you're saying, but I think like Bruce said, and you even said it, if we find PFAS, we already know it's there. Okay. So let's test and see if it's actually there. If it isn't, okay. We know what's there, but what's, I see, I see no negative in regards to, um, testing. I just, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around saying we should do a comprehensive review, but hold off on testing and put it as one package. We can have a section of that package called monitoring wells and do them now, do them biannually or whatever. Let's test them as much as we can to, well, 60 days. to get, days. yeah, to get, to get them as much data out there as we can. So personally, you know, and the commissioners have said, you know, we should, and, uh, you know, I'm still behind it. It, what I see is that it's it's distracting to mass DEP. It, it turns the landfill into solely a PFAS story, which takes away from mass DEP's focus of bringing the landfill into compliance. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. Yeah, that's not true. And I, and I hate to argue with you, but that, that's not true. DEP uh, works uh, on uh, on various levels with uh, with all kinds of different properties that have a wide range of, of, of problems with that property. Um, including air, soil, water, different contaminants in water, and they compartmentalize it and bring it forward. And then eventually it gets all put into one piece and, and, a, and a mediation um, uh, type of package gets, gets, gets done for it. But uh, as fast, the faster you can get the information out there, it can get looked at. Um, it's, it's proactive, not reactive. Um, we're going to get ahead of this thing at some point. Um, the world is going to catch on to this, and, uh, and the resources for doing things about it are going to get started to get eaten up. And now uh, we want to be fully on that curve ahead of all of that, so that little thing is, is the benefit of all that. And when it finally does come out that that there's a problem here in Littleton, and if it does come out that that landfill is uh, is uh, has been fingerprinted as, as one of the points. This isn't going to be a, a, a problem with one board against the other. We're going to sit down in a joint meeting. We're going to talk about this, you and I, and we're going to, us and you, and we're going to come to a, it's not going to be a water department solution. It's going to be a town of Littleton solution. So uh, the information that we need to go into that is, is, is vital to us. And the faster we get it, um, you know, the better, the better we're all going to be, uh, proactively, uh, transparently, uh, to the to the public, I think we owe it to them. If we can find out, we should find out as soon as we can find out. That's that's kind of our responsibility that we feel we have. If we were talking about any other group of contaminants, I would completely agree with you. I think this the story and the perception around PFAS and Mass DEP's response to PFAS is fundamentally different than because it's new, because it's emerging, it's the nature of emerging containment. I can't open up my email right now without six emails about um, PFAS of, of some type or another. Um, because of that, Mass DEP is looking, is liable to look at this as just a PFAS story. It, it, and I think that's what's unique about this, the, the PFAS <coughs> aspect of it. When it's already, there's no public health response that's going to be justifiable based on these <coughs> data. That I, I disagree. Moving the landfill into compliance <coughs> on its own track will absolutely pick up the PFAS sampling. And I, I would be more than happy to commit to you, you know, it, within the next six, nine months or something like that, if Mass DEP doesn't require it, we'll do it. I just don't understand why we would do just this sampling and do it outside of the context of all of the other data that we're going to collect and understand what's happening with the landfill as a whole and bring it into compliance. Well, well I'll, guarantee you, I'll guarantee you right now that it's not the last uh, parameter that they'll, you've got metals, you'll have VOCs, you'll have SO, there's a bunch of stuff that they'll want monitored out of, uh, out of that, uh, out of that 
monitoring well uh, uh, basin or whatever it is. Um, and this is not the end of it, but uh, as it comes uh, as it comes on our table, and we're starting to get the geared up here to do some PFAS investigation. I don't want to do PFAS here, 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 the whole time, and not here. It, it kind of doesn't make any sense that those five, six, eight wells, uh, monitoring wells that we're going to do, we're going to do everything else except these. I want a full picture. I, we, right. actually, I say I a lot. We want a full picture of the whole town, make a whole town decision with all the information that we can get here, and move forward with that. That's kind of, uh, that, that's been the consensus on the board, and I, I don't think, I, I don't think we're going to come off of that. I, I also don't understand, I, I don't mean any disrespect, Corey, but we're not just sampling wells in, in GW2 areas. We're, we're sampling wells outside of GW2 areas. So the, the idea that we want to know what it looks like all throughout the town, I understand that's a compelling idea, but we're looking at, we're looking in places that are distracting us from the fundamental concerns. If we're looking outside of GW2 areas, if we're looking around the landfill right now, when it's got its own compliance track, we're, we're putting together a data set that we don't know what we're going to do with it. What, you know, southeast of the gravel pit, that there are monitoring wells there, that's not a GW2 area, you know? So, um, same with the landfill. We know what's happening broadly in that zone too, based on what we see in air spec pond wells. So again, it, unless we have a plan for what we're gonna do with the data and, and what it means and how we're gonna roll it out to the public, simply pre presenting data to folks doesn't no, we won't, and we have, and I've tried to explain that we have the expertise to, to um, explain what that data means to people on a on a on a real day to day basis, and now uh, we don't have any idea what we're going to do with any of the data, but we're taking it, and we're going to figure it out as quickly as we can and but get the information that, I, out. Th therein lies my my fundamental problem. You you don't know what you're going to do with the data, so so should we not sample at all? No, we we should figure out what we're going to so do. So why with should we data. sample but not the not the uh, lands, landfill area? Uh, the the second topic that I had wanted to talk about is is <coughs> the plan around what are we going to do with the data? I do think we should sample. I think we should well, sample around the landfill. Once again, we with all the data, we don't know what we're going to do with it yet, but we're going to get all the data, and then we'll come up with a. Uh, with some kind of a, a, a consensus of a plan on, on, on what to do. It, it's prudent, it's, it's, it's proactive. People want to know. Can I just say? Sure. I'm sorry. Um, so, Mr. Chair, if I may, I guess that's my concern. So say we test, you test, and we get all this data. Resident, there's going to be a panic. There's going to be a concern among, amongst the public. What is the next step? So say you test my well, it's, it's positive for PFAS. I go to Corey, he explains the results to me, then what do I do? What's the next step? As a well owner? You're talking private it's, 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 on your it's up to you. Your okay, situation. so, all right, so it's up. We're, we're going to recommend don't drink it. Okay. Right. Fine. And, and we've so, already said that we would help out with, uh, with, uh, with bottled water. I think right. that's part of, the, part of that, what came out of, uh, what came out of um, uh, August meeting. Okay, okay. so what happens? Yeah. A certain part of the population that we want to know uh, that's interested to us if they're within the area that we're looking at we would love for them to test we would like that information and we would be willing to help them with uh, with with with, with, um, with water and, and but as far as anybody with any water issue in this town you're always welcome to call us I don't care if you're a if you're a Littleton water um, a customer ratepayer or, or not if you have a we have a, a moral responsibility because of the knowledge base that we have that uh, anybody that has a, uh, has a question on, on, on their drinking water, uh, um, private well or, or, or public, right. call us. Right, so, so, so I guess so that's my next your, question. To, to answer your question, we know we have PFAS. Right. And it's in the spec pond well. Okay. So any, you know, that's 52% of our water source. So everybody should be concerned. Right. Everybody should be, you know. I guess my concern is, what so how do we mitigate it like how we do our transmission uh our transmission blending we build our wickham ave treatment plant and we have a transmission main from spec pond to wickham ave and that comes out of the central distribution point okay and that's and that's part of why i was asking about the water department's plans to provide 
municipal water to some of the Correct. private right. water. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. All right. So, okay. So I understand that. So now back to Chase's point with respect to the incomplete fingerprint of the um, concerns with the landfill. Am I under understanding that correctly? There's still more testing to be done within the landfill outside well, of the past? What was, what was this test? That what was, was part of the compliance. The <coughs> Chris Starter was working with Tyne Bond on, on compliance monitoring on bringing the landfill back into the For DEP. So yep. testing has already started for the compliance okay. for the landfill. Right. There is more mm -hmm. testing expected. Correct. Right. And the, one, one piece of that was, wasn't PFAS. Should it have been? Probably should have right. been. So I guess that's my question. So testing. if we proceed with PFAS testing and how to mitigate that concern, what if something comes up within the landfill testing that now we have another concern that we still need to mitigate? Shouldn't we they run do have concerns that we yeah. have to mitigate. Yeah, so that's my concern. Shouldn't they run in tandem with each other as opposed to going wrong? We haven't tested for it yet, but you know the tests that have already been done, we have some serious issues with the testing walls there as it is. Right. So that has to be mitigated. That has to be brought into compliance. Listen, the PFAS question is has to be answered in all our testing wells. It has to be answered. Right. You know, we're testing, uh, we're testing a certain area where we know we have PFAS. Mm -hmm. There's a hundred other testing wells or eighty other testing wells throughout the town right. that have to be tested. And I don't think that we're arguing or saying it, we don't want it tested. Like we. No, I understand that. I really appreciate that. I think it's just a timing issue. Yeah. It's a process well, issue. And my so other issue is if. If we don't know what we're going to do, it, it, it's easy to sit here and say we're going to test for PFAS. But there are so many subtleties in that that putting, knowing what you're going to do with it actually dictates how you fundamentally do some of the analyses. If you're truly going to do fingerprinting work on it, um, there, there's a myriad set of decisions that need to be made. So if we don't know how we're going to use it and we're going to go collect it, then I've seen tons of forensic chemists who have pointed out that all of the PFAS sampling that's been done to date on this site or this site by sophisticated operators is useless for forensics work because they didn't know what they were going to do with the data before they collected it. So my point is that if we don't know what we're going to do with it, we're, we're likely to collect things that don't help us clarify the situation or help us understand what's going on. That's why every Superfund site has a sampling and analysis plan and a quality assurance project, you know, project plan. And there's Superfund sites before, you know, before any remediation is done and before any response action is done, there are literally years of coming up with what are we going to do with this data before we go and collect all of it. And that's what but I'm they saying. Have we to should have data to <laughs> analyze first, right? Which I think, I mean, I think to some extent we have enough and data to know that we should put together uh, a, I guess I don't a legitimate understand. plan for what we're going to do with it. We, we know what we have, but what else is out there in those wells? We don't know what, we don't know. We, we, the, the, the DEP recommendations, the testing have been done. And that these are the results. What if there's other, other chemicals that they, they didn't test for? PFAS. Why, why, I, I just don't see the negative part of going out and testing. We're, testings are, we're adding to existing data that's already here. It's already here, already done. That was recommended for the compliance issues at the dump. It's already here. We're just adding to. So, I, I, again, I don't know why, why that's Getting an issue. The curve. I don't know why that's an issue. But. And I don't want to have you, 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 you know this stuff way better than me. Yeah, I, I just want to add um, a couple of things. I guess we can get, you know. okay. Okay. I, I, you know, the majority of the calls that we get are from residents concerned and they want to know where it's coming from. That's a lot of the calls. Um, and I guess my other point would be. But I'm going to, I'll let you respond, I'll let you finish, but I, I want to say that unambiguously, based on the zone ones of our drinking, it's, it's not the, the landfill. So I, I understand their concerns there, but w we're sampling, we're mixing up messages when we talk uh, about I'll, I'll let Corey respond to that. That's well, yeah, let me just kind of clarify a little bit. So the, Sorry to cut you off. That's okay. So we have a communication plan on the agenda, so I assume we're getting to that point, right? 
Correct. Okay. Yeah, let me just briefly clarify one point there. So the zone two area is not representative of the entire area that the Spectacle Pond well draws water from. <coughs> it actually draws 25% of its water from the surface water from Spectacle Pond itself, which is why the entire watershed is relevant and is why we have monitoring wells in locations outside of the zone two. So that's uh, hopefully that addresses some of those questions you had there. I know it's sort of a technical thing a lot of people may not understand fully, but the reason we have monitoring wells throughout the watershed is because the entire watershed contributes water to the spectacle pond well. And um, the other comment I was going to make it is, is really comment back to this board. Um, the DEP never required us to do any testing of PFAS anywhere. We did it because it was the right thing to do. We wanted to know. We found it in our water. We had to do it because the air found it, so we felt the responsibility, but we didn't have to. If we waited for the DEP, spec plan would still be online. Uh, we wouldn't have these financial issues, and people would be drinking PFAS. So I, I just think when you hear these guys push back, that's where it's coming from because they, they've been fighting for uh, to solve this problem now since August, where it hasn't really been a board of selection issue until now. Um, so the, and, and they have to handle a lot of the residents that are asking questions about that. I personally have no problem with, yeah. with testing. I, 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 you gather the data, and if you use it later on, you use it later on, but it's, it's, it's stuff that you have. Right. Uh, 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 Mike Selden, uh, a member of the Board of Health. This is a, a question for you, Chase. <clears throat> uh, without going into the details, uh, if you were asked how many different, and I'm going to be careful, physical chemical forms of, quote, PFAS there are, does that help understanding what you're trying to get at in terms of why you collected the data, what you're going to do with it, depends on what? In other words, is it or is the concern over the subtle, not the subtle, but the physical chemical differences among the various compounds that fall into this master class? Well, I guess that's fundamentally the question, right? Are, are we looking at just PFOS exceedances per what we expect to the mass DEP basis for PFOS exceedances to be, right? That's Looks like the drinking water standard will be six as well, right? Six individual six compounds, compounds yeah. right? I mean, this this is a class of thousands of different uh, isomers. Yep. Um, and then furthermore, there's when you start to open up the forensics bag, it becomes an order of magnitude more complicated than that. And that's, that's why I feel like we need to understand what are we going to do with the data? And what decisions are we going to make based on it before we go collect it? Because not all data, it, there is a lot of data that is actually distracting from achieving the objective of responding. Because it's bad data, because it's ambiguous data, because it, it, because it lacks any meaningful data quality. Um, and that, that gets into some of the uh, communication aspects of this with respect to residential drinking water wells. Um, if we don't know how we're going to validate it, we don't know what uh, individual analyses we're going to do, we don't know what we're going to do with respect <coughs> to fingerprinting, um, then I don't see how this helps us so, until we can answer that. And, and then what happens is the public uh, fear fills that void. I guess that's really what it comes down to and we're no better off we're no closer to responding to this if we go get the data and then figure out what the hell we're going to do with it then if we figure out what we're going to do with it and then go get the data the end point is we have data and we know what we're going to do with it but in one scenario we allow a whole bunch of data to exist in a vacuum or the other is we know what we're going to do with it we go get it and we respond to it so that, that, that fears there now it's just you guys might not know about it because it's, it's being filtered through us. Um, and we're making design decisions and spending millions of dollars to fix this. Where do we find out the landfill is contributing to it? And there's things that we can take in effect now to change our design or, or I mean, what if it keeps getting higher spec pond? You know, so I, I just, I, I mean, I agree with the board. I, I think there's, knowing will help us with our, with our decisions moving forward. And as far as the objective of the data collection, it's, we can't lose sight of the fact that we're not just picking on the landfill. It's just part of our overall groundwater monitoring program throughout town. We have objectives for that program. It's, the, the objectives are no different here. It's just to identify the locations of contaminants that are affecting the water quality in our water supply. So the 
the point of sampling the landfill is the same as sampling any of the commercial properties in that watershed. It's just to identify sort of spatially in the watershed where might these contaminants be coming from. So that's really the sole purpose of our data collection. And then there's potentially subsequent steps that come after that that are in the hands of DEP potentially. But um, it's really just the same as any other property in town where we plan on sampling for PFAS. Mr. Chairman, do you want to talk about a communication plan? Sure. Uh, are you all set? I mean, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. If I, I don't see either of us. Uh, I guess changing our. I, I'm unlikely to change my opinion. I don't. What are you afraid of? That That's all I'm asking. What are you afraid of? In the, in the I, I'm afraid. Of, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid of uh, fear filling the void. Okay. That. It goes back to exactly what I said, the, the timeline to collect the data and then figure out what we're going to do with it. We have to do those two things. Okay? If we go collect the data and then we figure out what we're going to do with it, then we've got a bunch of data that I understand the desire to, to, to release it to the public, but it lacks context. It lacks any um, utility until we know what we're going to do with it. I would rather know what we're going to do with it and then go get the data. And frankly, that results in better data quality when you know not, not just we want to identify sources but how are we going to do it? I mean the, the details of a sampling and analysis plan and a quality assurance project plan are, are much more nuanced than just we want to find sources. Well the, we would do it the same way that the sampling was just done a month ago by time bond at the, at the landfill. It's the same thing it's adding one more parameter to that list. It's the same purpose. It's just a screen for potential contaminants. There's no, nothing more to it at this stage. There's obviously, as you know, subsequent stages where things get much more detailed and complex. I mean, we and I think I agree to disagree on it. It's not as simple as just adding a, a simple compound. Given, given, it, go ahead, gentlemen. Go ahead, absolutely. Assuming we find whatever levels you guys are talking mm -hmm. in a language I can't understand, but it's above six, you guys have some plan. I mean, this is not new to you. You guys have been talking about it since since August. So, assuming that we need to do some sort of remediation, that's been discussed. You guys have some plans in place, and depending upon where we're at, and again, then, we'll, then go, we'll go, we'll go back plan. to the thirteen million, up to twenty six million dollars right. that we're going to be doing to remediate right. what we what we know right now, what we know, and that's to answer your question, Chuck. That's the way we're moving forward. You know, we want to get clean water out to all the residents <laughs> in town. Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is to make sure we get our transmission lines done, our our blending done, our new treatment plant done, and that's your answer. That, that's, the, that's to remediate the water supply. supply. And water supply. Not, not the landfill. Not right. the landfill. Correct. Right. right. Yeah, and, and it's two separate things. There are two, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to say that. It's two separate issues for sure. Julie, do you have a question? I just... If you're accepting public input, I just wanted to provide um, a comment, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I, I think this conversation is great. I'm really you know, happy to see Littleton getting in front of this super challenging and um, emerging issue. Um, so I, I manage um, cleanups on the super fun scale um, around the Northeast. And I just wanted to provide some perspective with uh, regarding the state of remediation technology at this point and really what it is is protecting drinking water supplies um, you know s similar to what air <coughs> is doing um, there unless you're going to intercept the <coughs> coming from the landfill um, there's really no way to remediate PFAS solids um, so a traditional remediation method for a landfill could be digging out soils and disposing of it there's nowhere to dispose of it. You need to incinerate it. And so therefore, the current state of remediation is you leave it in place. Um, when I drill a monitoring well to determine what's going on with my site, I can no longer drum my soils if there are PFAS contaminants in my soils and send them elsewhere. There's nowhere to send it at this point in time. And so I would say the thing that would need to be determined is, in my opinion, what are likely remediation strategies for the landfill, and then you collect your data accordingly. 
um, and a situation I can think of where perhaps we would collect data that would not be useful. Um, our, you know, PFAS, I'm sure, as Corey can attest and many can attest, the PFAS standard is a moving target. Um, the feds have not promulgated anything. The 70 parts per trillion is a health advisory. It's not a standard. And so the states are doing their standards, and it's kind of a moving target. Um, one of the New England states regulates each of the six current constituents that are regulated individually. And so one, I believe, is as low as 12 parts per trillion. Um, so if we collect data trying to meet, you know, thinking the Massachusetts 20 parts per trillion is something that we need to get to, you know, and the lab has to dilute a sample, for example, and so now we're above the 20, and then we get new standards a year down the road when we're ready to do something about the landfill, and oh, oops, by the way, now the standard's 12. Our data are, in fact, useless. Um, I could see wanting to know where it's come where it's coming from and collecting some data for informational purposes to say is it or is it not present but I would caution <coughs> spending a lot of money trying to wrap our brain around it without a solid strategy for remediation and that's, that's just I, I have um, one of my projects is a landfill um, in another state the public water supply is shut down due to discharge from among other things my landfill um, so I have a <laughs> Some decent experience. I'm a professional geologist as well, so I have some decent experience in this area. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little bit of um, perspective just from, you know, and we're all chasing it. I mean, everybody's chasing it. It's not just Littleton, um, but it really is evolving, and I would really caution spending a lot of money without having a, a solid idea of what, of really what we can do with the data. Julie, can you just identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Julie Rupp, New Estate Road. And conservation. I'm a stickler for that. <laughs> I'm not here uh, <laughs> representing conservation at the moment. Mr. Chair, moving on about the yep. communication plan. All right. So, again, um, I think what we need to do is keep those communication lines open, you know. And this is just something that uh, we put together um, up for discussion. <coughs> you know, uh, we have two issues, two separate issues. Um, that we're dealing with PFAS in the landfill. Uh, I think uh, personally that we're we're in it together, you know, and we have to be in it together for both issues. Um, again, you know, uh, uh, communication, people from each board, you guys make your own decisions, but the uh, we the the water commissioners know who uh, we want on these committees. Uh, Board of Health, again, you guys can make your decisions also. We threw this out there just to say we need some, communica we need some communication. We need one point of contact so that we know that all the communication from the entire PFAS or landfill is going to these communication points and can be disseminated, disseminated from there. Um, and we're not having four or five different people getting information. So that was uh that's what this slide is all about and what's open up for discussion uh, communicate yeah communicate <laughs> well not so much that single point of contact is is very important well i'll reiterate something that's that's been said here a couple times already <clears throat> i've said it myself that um, um littleton water especially corey Nick and Corey seem to be the uh, the logical um, place where information should be should come from. Um, Corey's the only uh, full time environmental analyst that we have on any department in town, and uh, in as much he uh, has spent a lot of this time. And plus, like I said before, he's got um, a nationally backed um, engineering firms that he's discussing this all with. Uh, he's up to date. I mean, we don't have all the answers. No one has all the answers, but he's got the most current answers. So, uh, me personally, I think that uh, fear exists in a vacuum of information, and uh, to give somebody information that's the the latest greatest, um, you also tell them that this is this is an imperfect information that I'm giving you, but it's the latest greatest. This is what we got. Stay tuned. If you need something else. As soon as I get it, you'll get it. People will have confidence in that, and they'll understand that uh, 
that their uh, <coughs> excuse me their government is is working for them, doing the doing the best that that, that can be done for them. So I think that uh, I think the War Department is the uh, is the um, the logical choice to uh, to broadcast uh, information from, and I think actually Corey is the person at the War Department that it should all come from. I mean, I have a lot of conferences in this guy. Are you referring to just PFAS, or are you referring to both? All water quality. Yeah. All well, water regard quality. to the landfill as well. Sure. I mean, uh, the 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 the, uh, the information or the uh, or the knowledge base that he'll have is probably going to surpass that of uh, of anybody else in the town. I, I, I'm saying positively Employees. will. Sure. Yeah. Specifically so, on the water quality piece, yeah. On the water quality piece, there's no, there's no questioning that. But I, I, I'm assuming that, uh, I'm not assuming. I'm telling you that, um, as far as this whole situation goes, no one's going to know more than Corey, and uh, and I think the communication should come between. This is important. Our board of Health, uh, Board of Selectmen, and uh, Board of Water Commissioners need to be together on this. We need to be, we need to be partnered up in this so that uh, we have uh, one face, Corey's face. And uh, and that's the face that we put out to the public, and we should all uh, we should all try to even if we have certain uh, disagreements, we should disagree and commit to uh, to the answers that come out of this uh, out of this uh, joint meeting. And, and I think that our best bet would be to have uh, uh, Corey be our, sp our spokesperson for what it's worth. The only suggestions that I have at this point is probably defining what that means for the landfill, since that's the Technically, if we were to create a divide, you know, the PFAS issue is under the responsibility of the Water Commissioners and the General Manager and Corey and others, uh, Kevin. Um, but for the landfill, technically, I, you know, that's our responsibility. Honestly, if you guys want to take the landfill. No, 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 no. He's not saying that. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, teasing. I'm, I'm teasing. I heard it. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm teasing, but I'm saying, you know, yeah. if it's, it's a ball of wax, and it's something we have to deal with, and I recognize that. I just want to get clarification as to what the role will be and how the <coughs> um, communication will flow. The only other comment that I'll make about the landfill is there's a an obvious piece that sticks out at me that under the Board of Selectmen it should both be the DPW director and myself. Um, so, I, and I'm happy to, I'm sure Chris, myself, and Jim could work out what that means and report back to the boards. I don't know as though we need to have a lengthy discussion tonight. I just want to make sure that you know, everyone is in the loop on, you know, how, how things get handled, how information gets disseminated, and so on and so forth. I think um, uh, with respect to uh, um, your position and who it should come from, I, I would hope that you would, uh, uh, the town would acquiesce to the greater knowledge base and say that it's in the best interest of the public that, uh, that someone with uh, the most knowledge and the one who's making the most uh, up-to-date decisions would be the one that's uh, kind of the mouthpiece for the whole thing. Well, it I, gives I, the. the no, I'm going to stop you right there. I, I'm going to just stop you there for just for a second. I think Nina. What Nina's saying is, you know, she, she wants says she wants to separate the land, the the landfill away from the which, PFAS. Which we are. We are. We will have two two separate things because they are different. Um, what what I listen. I think what we need to do is have single point of contact for each board and you know let that those individuals communicate cross commu cross pollinate and communicate what's going on with the landfill what's going on with PFAS make sure the board of selectmen is aware make sure your board of health is aware make sure we're all aware that's why those three elements are together I personally would rather see you know that group that's dealing with the landfill communicate through that group and, and and keep in that group and PFAS communicate through that group but for one single point of contact for the Board of Selectmen it'll be for Nina you know um, or Chris or whomever I mean, if, if those folks and I think you properly identified you know the needs to be in the loop if they're all communicating together yep. Then it should work, and you are right, Bruce. There should the, there needs to be one consistent message, and Corey's the like, the right person for that. But that doesn't mean inevitably questions are going to come in to Nina or Joe or whoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as long as we're kind of reading off the same script, you know, then uh, it should take care of itself. So or just defer. Yeah, it, when when possible, and when not possible, at least make sure you're you know you're saying the same things. You know. 
And I, and I would think that Nina and, and the, the Board of Health and, and, and Chris would funnel things, together. funnel things right, right back through you, Corey. If that's the board, if that's what the board would like me to do, I'm happy to, you know, have Corey be our spokesperson. As I said before, I just want to define what that means and I want to understand what that means and I want to report back to you as to what that means. Um, because I don't want to miss any of my responsibility and I'm sure Corey doesn't want to miss any of his responsibility. Well, to be clear, when we say landfill up there, we really just mean landfill in the context of the groundwater monitoring. It's, it's not like you're going to get into the business of scheduling. No, no. Right. right. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the obvious out there. It, in the context of that issue, right. sure. Right. Okay, that right. wasn't clear to me, so that okay. helps. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. when it right. I mean, I think in, in terms of <coughs> landfill response, we still, Chris needs to be the, the point DEP person. point of contact right. and, yeah, yeah, and all yeah, of that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I'm just talking monitoring. Okay. Okay. We're just talking monitoring. Okay. Yeah, when it comes to operations and compliance activities at the landfill, I would say that properly belongs under right. Chris or Jim. Yeah. 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 I'm actually less concerned about the, the landfill aspect of it. I mean, that's our professional staff. You guys are great. You guys communicate really well with each other. My, my bigger concern actually is the communication with the public when lots of residential drinking water well, uh, private drinking water well owners get PFAS data back and how we're, how we're communicating that and, and what we're saying and what we're not saying. I mean, fr frankly, at this point, even MassDEP won't put their name behind a particular drinking water treatment technology, a, a particular point to use drinking water treatment technology. So how... <coughs> How do we respond to people there? And furthermore, how do we, are, are you evaluating their data? Who's the chemist that's looking at it? You know, how are we helping them contextualize it? That, I mean, Chuck, if you thought the rounding rules with respect to liquor licenses and stuff were, were asinine, you should see the rounding rules associated with PFAS exceedances in drinking water. Um, so I'm partly concerned about our liability, but I'm also, Partly concerned. What I don't want is the public to get a lab report and we say, Phew, "That's complicated. Good luck." And I know we're not saying that, but where do we? Where can we stop? And, and I, that where we can stop is not clear to me. And, and frankly, at some point, it may require putting some resources behind that so that the public has someone. Frankly, so it's not Corey's full-time <coughs> job providing data quality. Of, analyses on on residential drinking water and all lab reports so i that's a that's right now that's a moving line so as information becomes uh, available and more is known um that line on what's uh what can be told and what is known it's it's changing you know it's changing but i think that our responsibility is to uh give the most recent interpretation of 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 the data that we can give uh, allowing that uh, more to come or even better get a new transmission line right down and say jump on oh I, I, you know oh you should all be on yeah, town yeah, water. You know, jump great. on that solves a lot of those 100 percent those issues like you were just saying you know, betterments right? there's all kinds of ways to get you on town water mm -hmm. well why, why don't we just let this group do its next steps but i think it should be heard loud and clear that we're all going to be interested in what the next communication mechanisms are to the town okay. so Great. i think we'll be looking to see you know i, I will anyway what Great. what you intend to do with that information or what you intend okay. to do with that information and how we should be disseminating it and serving the public in that context and I, I still think that we should probably have a conversation, the four of us, to discuss the landfill as it relates to the groundwater monitoring and what that means so that it's not ambiguous as to what your role is, Corey, as proposed by the water commissioners and, and Nick, obviously. And, and I think I don't hear the board having an objection, but I just want to make sure that we're all clear on what that means. You know, does it mean that... Corey's here every time we discuss the landfill because there are going to be some groundwater, groundwater monitoring aspects. What are those nuances that I think we need to figure out? Because I, I certainly don't want to be in a situation where um, I'm reporting on some information to the Board of Selectmen and then there's confusion as to whether I should have been reporting on that or sh someone else should have been in the room to report on that. And conversely, we at... Uh I like water. Our water commissioners don't want to be sitting in a meeting 
saying, uh, can we uh, disseminate some of this uh, information, or do we have to go through uh, this? Uh, these are our, respectfully speaking, these are our monitoring wells. They're our responsibility to uh, to sample them, and it's our responsibility as a board to uh, come up with a policy with what we do specifically for us and our information with the what comes out of those monitoring wells. Um, we're happy to uh, bring you guys in and, 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 and uh, make this, uh, um, like I say, a one face for the town, but uh, understand full well that uh, we have a responsibility, those are our wells, that we have a responsibility to, uh, to sample them, and we are going to uh, let, the, let the public know what, what's, what's there. So, and, and, uh, if, we'll go back and forth. If, if there's any, uh, if you want to take a stab at clarification, you get together with you know the folks. Yeah. And that would be my. That's my yeah. proposal. Right. Yep. Yeah. Great. That sounds good. We can live with that. All right. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank Thanks you. a lot, guys. Thank, Thank you. Time. Very important stuff. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck, planning board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Learn it. Twenty-four years. Whatever the hell it is. That was how to bring things to to an end. But this going. I wish I should have done it an hour earlier. I don't have to, but I think I might bug out on this. I'm so active in front of these guys. Just, uh, yeah, only, only because I risk pissing somebody off, you know. Uh, I hope I don't end up I'm just ready because I'm a 4-4 four, four boat and Chase is going to text me again to come back out. I think we'll be all right. Chase gets off the phone and goes, oh my god. How could you know? Yeah, Paul, you probably I don't have those questions. I'm going to find out of here because I still have the project with these guys. I'm sure you guys can work Yeah, do you have extra copies of the questions needed or no? Sorry? So we got to hire a replacement. You want copies of the questions? Yeah, I just thought we'd be here. We can make that happen right now. Yeah, that's Oh, yeah, please. Um, what's the next guy? I'm going to find out. 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 I'm no, there was just disagreement as to whether we should even ask those questions, so I thought those that were Who's going to be asking the questions? I don't know who's going to be asking, but just as a point of going forward, I would love to send you applicants those questions a week in advance and say, why don't you write out, we collectively have five questions, we want you to write some answers to. Then we can read those and have a conversation with them. I think there's good questions. Oh, I got so many different yeah. ideas that so no, it became, so I don't know what to do with this yeah, information, yeah. and I, have no I just idea. assumed that whoever wanted to put Joe's printing it for us. So. I thought Paul's point, yeah, to, to, to the point you just made, we were just going to wing it. Yeah. Everyone had a different perspective, so I just said, I know if you're going to get back to you. I know if Oh, that's a, I got a process. That's why we got one. You could get set of questions with a. You're, you're the acting chair, and it's and it's and it's your. Yeah. No, yeah, no, and. How are we going to ask the questions? Are you going to ask the questions? Is it I.O.E.O.? Any more going to ask the questions? Is someone down here? Well, the Paul's here. I mean, I don't know. Do so is there a, we are an official format? No, no, no. I know. I get it. No, I is there a format for this? Yeah. Standard format? I, I just don't know how we should add it. Usually, 
someone takes a question and you go around. That's so cool. I don't want to do it again. I don't care. Yeah, I have no problem with the questions. It's on. I mean, email around. Yeah, it's not our What I'd like to do is all those questions are good, but then be able to open up if anyone has something else comes up. You want to ask a, a question to somebody. Well, how do you want to do it for you want to ask? What, you want to ask a question from that list? Ask the question from the list, and then allow anybody here to follow up <laughs> yeah. on that question. I think that's yeah. right. I think that's right. Yeah. If, if you have a follow-up question, bang. Yeah. And I just go through it. How are you? How are you doing? Hey. Oh, good. How are you? Good. <laughs> Mr. Knox, how are you? And then what are we going to deliberate? Are we going to come back? Yeah. Yeah. Do we, do we clear the room and not deliberate? Do we talk about the candidates? No? What do you do? How do you do this? Oh, you can't. Usually we just vote. can't clear the room. The other driver. I know, but you're deliberating on a technically hiring somebody for a couple of meetings. That's what all you got, huh? I'm good. Good, thanks. Either way, it's fine. It's fine. Well, we're not really hiring. I mean, it's a volunteer position. You know? Okay, welcome to the next part of the Board of Selectors meeting. It's a joint meeting with the Planning Board. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the Acting Chair of the Planning Board to initiate how we're going to do this and how we're going to interview and move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a joint meeting between the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board to appoint an interim Planning Board member between now and the next May election and this is to fill a vacancy uh, left by uh, member uh, Ed Mullen who is now the town building commissioner so we were just discussing a little bit about the process and so we have two candidates uh, for um, for the appointment and we would like to uh, uh, talk with both candidates and we have a set of uh, questions and I'll go ahead and and ask those questions of each of the members and if there are other questions that come up as a result please um, fellow members uh, go ahead and, and ask those questions so at this point uh, we can go ahead and begin unless there are any other questions from from board members no all set, all set. Okay. all right so who gets to go first is there a preference so if you would like to um, have a seat and then introduce yourself, and we do have um, your application, um, but if you could briefly tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me here. My name is Eli Constantino. I live at 16 Cooper Farm Lane. I've been uh, living in Littleton for about three years now with my family, and I'm looking to see uh, Littleton grow responsibly. All right. Terrific. Thank you. So. Uh, if appointed by the Planning Board and the Select Board, do you intend to run for the seat in May, or are you proposing to serve as a caretaker until <coughs> the town general election? I would consider running in May. All right. The town recently approved specific bylaws for development aimed at creating affordable housing in our community. Please provide your thoughts about these bylaws and um, what you think about them. So affordable housing, of course, is very important. Um, I need to get more intimately familiar with the bylaws to speak exactly about them, um, but certainly there's an important component of how, uh, affordable housing. I've noticed, I've watched a few of the meetings, I see how it's trying to be uh, brought about, um, and the pluses and the minuses. So, so what are the, some of the pluses and minuses associated with affordable housing, in your opinion? Uh, well, it's uh, the way they're being pitched. Some of the minuses are the way they're being, uh, I guess I'll use the word shoehorned onto some of the lots. Um, it's, it's necessary to have it. It's just a matter of how it's, how it's structured, how the town area is preserved. <clears throat> As a, if you were a board member, <clears throat> how would you rate how we did doing the affordable housing? Uh, the, the two that we've seen so far. What would you have done differently, if anything? Uh, it's a great question. I actually can't comment specifically on, the, on the, what has happened in the past. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I can't comment on that. Okay. 
you think we're doing a good job so far? Uh, from what I've seen, uh, there certainly are some struggles before you, and I, I think that the way they've been wrestled with has been responsible. Thank you. That was a very good answer, by the way. All right. Next question. Are you familiar with form-based code, which is um, the proposed zoning amendments for the common, and if so, what role and impact do you believe for base code could have on the redevelopment of the common area. So I do like uh, what the form based code is trying to accomplish. I know that uh, there's um, a lot of varying opinions on it. Um, I think it's important to maintain the character of this area of Littleton. Um, yeah, I like, like what it's trying to accomplish. Okay. And have you had um, an opportunity to think about what zoning changes like that could mean for the Littleton Station area? Uh, I have not. Okay. Would you just throw that, that right back at you? Um, the station on Foster, um, there's been a lot of, actually several of us up here are on a working group and we've got a consultant that's working with us to try to look at opportunities to redevelop that area. If you could just kind of give us your opinion on what you think would be a good change in that area. Um, I, I'd like to get reacquainted with that area, to be honest. I, I've only been here for three years. I, you know, sorry I wasn't just prepared for these specific questions. Um, I would definitely like to take a, a look at the area. Can I follow that question up real quick, Joe? Certainly. Right. So in terms of what would you be looking for in sort of transportation oriented development what what would differentiate a meaningful transportation oriented development project to you I guess accessibility parking um, really just being accessible to the, the community around here that it serves are you a a commuter yourself, a, a commuter rail no. traveler? No. Okay. I do commute, but not by rail. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what role do you think the planning board has in implementing the town's master plan? A uh, huge role. Um, I think that the master plan is, is a great, um, a great uh, pointing mechanism. I think it's, it's up to the board to make sure that the plans that are proposed <laughs> Um, comply with it. Um, I'd say the, the board's role is as probably the most pivotal role in implementing the master plan. If um, there's a lot in the master plan, right? If if I had to, um, if I had to make you select a couple things that you would really like to make your sort of personal priorities. Um, with respect to the master plan, or maybe even more broadly than that, what would you put in one, maybe two top priorities for you? So I think that uh, preserving the, the character of Littleton, the appearance of Littleton as a rural community is pretty important, as well as maintaining um, a wide spectrum of housing available for not just seniors, but also other young families looking to move into Littleton. What do you think are the most two most important considerations when considering how to approach satisfying the master plan. What, what should be our, the, the board's number one concern? Um, I think people are going to be looking for results uh, as quickly as possible. So I would say uh, implementation. What kind of results? Uh, knowing that plans are coming coming before you that uh, are in line with the master plan and that you're looking at them with that eye. Okay. If you think of the master plan, do you think that it's something that we, we should follow mm -hmm. step by step? Or is it something that the town puts forward as a tool for in the future of the planning board or the board selectmen to use as a guide? I guess I'm trying to say, the master plan's here, we've got to follow page one and this and didn't take this section. Or is it something that we, when you start coming to a subject that you, we, you want to rely on 
this as a guide to it or a tool? Uh, great question. I think uh, that it should be used as a guide, but I think we, we need to be careful about how we do that. The more uh, open it is to interpretation, the more gray area there's going to be in the future and more uh, point of contention. Well, what do we need to be careful about? Uh, wiggle room. For what? Let's say somebody's proposal is asking for something that's uh, kind of a gray area in the master plan. Uh, opening up that Pandora's box by giving them you know whatever it's going to be whether it's an open area concession or w whatever it might be um, anybody else who comes before you afterwards is going to use that as a guide well I guess it's my question what I'm trying to get around what I'm trying to get at is do you understand that once we put in a, a bylaw you execute the bylaw you don't have discretion right it's either approved use or it's not either meets the density or it's not it either has the offset or it doesn't right that's one aspect of what we do. The other aspect is policy. When we consider policy, what what I'm concerned about is what do you consider when you, you think about implementing policy? The master plan is a vision document. It has a roadmap. It has implementation steps. But what should you be considering first and foremost when you implement that? What the people are looking for when they put that master plan together. Um, if I give pause for just one moment, um, Mr. Yates, um, would you kindly step out of the room oh, sure. and for the remainder of the questions? Thank you. <clears throat> you moved to Littleton three years ago because you liked Littleton. You liked the rural character, how um, uh, there's diversity of some diversity of housing, good school systems, and everything else. If you were on the master plan, I mean, excuse me, if you were on the planning board, what do you see as the priorities to continue with what you saw in Littleton? For the people that are coming schools and housing schools and housing yep more diversity of housing um definitely definitely uh, elderly housing something to do with the seniors who want to get out of their big big houses absolutely there. um i'm just throwing them to you so yeah you that's okay and thank you for that but also for for younger families looking to move in right yeah um the, the knock has always been that you know we're losing too much farmland and everything but as we've gone back in time Littleton was a farm. It was all farms and everything. So there has to be some place for the houses to go. What do you feel about being creative to try to su to sustain as much of the open space and, and farmland that we still have left? Uh, how do you see and what uh, what ways would you want to look at doing that? I'm all for preserving that that farm, the the, the rural character. Uh, you know, as, as as you drive down 119, that whole appearance, that whole that whole road there is. is pretty awesome I'd love to maintain that um, at the same time though we've got to give up some of that land for housing so structuring the open area so that's visible from the road etc uh, I think is pretty important um, and structuring it so that the open area is all together and not uh, kind of behind lots you know, in the perimeter um, is also pretty important beneficial space viable open space right okay. thank you Mr. Montanari just said viable open space. What, um, if we use that as a criteria, it's not really a criteria, but what, what does viable open space mean to you? A space where my kids can go and play. I thought that was a good word, viable. No, no, I think it's great. I, in fact, I kind of wish it had a home in our, in our regulations somewhere, right? Because we certainly see a, a lot of, non-viable I mean open space that you can't less than viable walk on right. without sinking or maybe a different definitions of viable right yeah. well, that would be great for a future conversation <laughs> <laughs> thank you Chase I always thought it viable. so okay um, I have a question so, so um, what what do you think you would bring to the planning board in terms of experience expertise how would your background um, enhance what what we already have on the planning board so um, being a member of the planning board would definitely be something new to me um, I've never had such a position um, I have had positions in, in construction projects very large construction projects uh, running them uh, I've got no issue with that um, as far as coming up with creative ideas to solutions I've done a fair no number of those in my life as well um, and just kind of order and uh, organization so your your experience in construction is on large commercial and residential and residential so multi-use or what kind of residential 
single, single family? Single family, currently, okay. currently doing a lot of single families. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that, that's actually um, a good point about your experiences. Um, as, a mem as a member of a, of a public board, um, we are asked to identify any potential conflicts of interest. And um, so I was wondering if you can think of any offhand that you would have being a planning board member for the next couple of months, whether no. okay. Right. Don't have any relatives who are developers in town, or no. do you, you don't do work in town, or do you do work in town? Not currently. So we we do have a lot of applications um, that come before us, and with your experience, um, what kinds of focus would you have when when you were looking at these various applications? Do you have a particular expertise? Uh, sure, basically um, looking at them with conformance to the bylaws. Okay. Are you uh, trained in, are you, you're not an engineer, but you can obviously can read blueprints, you oh, can sure. do drainage. Oh, sure. I went to school for architecture and construction management. Yeah. So, so you can, you can, you know your way pretty well around the city. Absolutely. No question. <clears throat> we have a meeting on Monday, February 10th, and then the first Thursday of each month after that. Um, do you foresee any attendance concerns given the fact that we have a lot of pending applications and we'd like to continue to move forward on as many as possible? Well, that's fine. No, con no concerns there? No concerns. Okay. Do you mind being on television? <laughs> no, I would never compare it to you, of course, but... <laughs> no, I do my <laughs> Well, now we have these awesome high-definition cameras and everything. Glad you said it. <laughs> um, from a planning perspective, what do you see as the biggest concern for the community? Um, I, I think it's, it's going to be the farms coming up for sale uh, and what happens to that land. And then... Um, Based on on having been here for three years, um, do you know a lot of folks in town? Do you know any of the planning board or any of the board members sitting here tonight? Uh, I no, I mean I've seen you all. I've never met you until just this evening. Okay. Nice to meet you all. <laughs> <laughs> sure, you want to do this? <laughs> um, if there aren't any other questions, I, I'd like to ask Eli if he has questions for us. I'm going to throw something out there, just a standard interview question. Just, um, first of all, thank you for putting yourself forward and, and volunteering just to, to at least fill in stuff up and potentially run run for the seat. How long will the seat be? Another year or is it two? No, for three and a half months. No, no, right Once now. But then oh, for right now. Five years. And, no, well, and seat will terminate next year, right? Term, right? Yeah, it, it would be five years. It five would have been years. up. Oh, we would have been yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. So it would have been up right now, so you'd be running for five years. Uh, sentence, I mean, running for five years. Um, just <laughs> <laughs> you would uh, what are, what are one or two qualities that you feel would uh, kind of along the lines of what Delisa asked just what are some strengths or some qualities that you would bring to the planning board that make you the right candidate for us to choose today? so I mean I'd like to see both I'd like to see the town prosper and grow uh, but I'd also like to see the town maintain its rural character um, and I think that my experience in construction as well as managing different projects would kind of help me on both sides of that desire. Any questions from you? Uh, I, I actually don't have any questions. Um, I did watch a couple of the videos. Thank you for that entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, thank you. All right. Okay. Terrific. Well, thank you again for your time. Okay. And, and, um, Apologize for the delay, but no thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for being patient. I feel like I should apologize for the delay. So. <laughs> yeah, we do too. Um, so just real quick on process. Mr. Yates will come in. We'll ask him the questions, and then will we deliberate? And so both of them would like to stay if they can. Or? Yeah, I think because okay. yeah. we're going to make a decision tonight. Yeah. 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 Right, and certainly the board has the discretion to ask if they, you know, ask to deliberate without candidates in the room, but, you know, that's not, considering the open meeting law, you can't require it, and so it's up to you how you want to handle that. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. So if, if you would like to stay, we'll call okay. you back. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Hello.
He's actually welcome to stay in the room. Yeah, you can stay in the room. You don't okay. have to go out. Yeah, you That's true, because okay. you now know the questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so first, I'm coughing. So I have some armor, but uh, hopefully we'll as long be okay. This is not the coronavirus. You, I have not been in China. China. Okay. I have not, you know, so. It's the first thing you have to ask, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So anyway, I don't know if that question was on the list of things to ask me. <laughs> Are you currently in mail? Yeah. Right. So um, would you please introduce yourself and tell us I'm just a little bit about yourself? Um, I don't know what's considered a long-term resident, but I've been here for over 30 years. I've raised my family here. I have, uh, in terms of, um, some of you may know me from your kids. Some of you may know me that I'm the vice chair of the Board of Appeals. Um, and as such, I've been involved in some of the issues that, you know, in a tangential way, especially housing, that come before the board. Uh, professionally, I'm an architect. I um, primarily do residential work, not much in Littleton, although Mark is surrounded by my work. Um, and uh, I do work for developers. I do go before planning boards in other towns, <coughs> lately Lincoln. Uh, my work is all over um, Needham, Wellesley, primarily in Wellesley, uh, Newton, Brookline, Concord, Acton. Um, and so I'm familiar with um, zoning bylaws, and I'm familiar with the ways different towns uh, craft their bylaws for their uh, for their purposes. And I definitely have opinions on what's successful and what's not. I also have um, <coughs> opinions on, um, you know, having some of my clients are developers. I find them to be very creative. And um, I, I guess I would say that <clears throat> bylaws definitely um, impact the form of your town. There's just no doubt about it. And um, they can be blunt instruments or subtle instruments, uh, but there's, they definitely have an impact. Do you have any uh, examples? Well, I'll tell you what happened has been happening in Wellesley over the last couple of years, and um, <clears throat> where s certain people in town were upset at teardowns. You know, it's a it's a big thing within you know 128, and crafted more and more bylaws to limit the size of the houses being built. <clears throat> that impacted the amount of money that people could get to sell their house when they were retiring limiting you know chunk you know knocking off you know chunks of a hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars three hundred thousand dollars but um you know a lot of it was indirect height addicts this that the other thing and uh it has not abated you know the the, the terrorists have not abated uh, there's just different expectations, and um, houses may have gotten somewhat smaller. They may may have gotten some less taller, but there's still it's still happening. So, I guess that's an example of um, instituting bylaws that weren't explicit in their goals. If the goal is to to ban teardowns, you know they could have and teardowns, but it's literally taking money out of the pockets of the people who own property in the town. Um, so they couldn't do that. Anyway, it's a sort of a tangent, but that's one of, you know, that's an example that I've been dealing with. So, so we're going to go through the list of questions sure. and, and others as they come up. Um, so if you're appointed by the planning board and select board, do you intend to run for the seat in May, or are you proposing to serve as a caretaker until the town's general election? When I applied, I was uh, interested in being a caretaker, and I am now open to the possibility of running. Um, talk to, you know, the, the person most impacted by this would be Sherry Gould, the chairman of the board of uh, appeals and we've chatted about this and uh, 
So I would be, uh, you know, I think I would be available to run. But you wouldn't stay on the Board of Appeals? No. Okay. No, it's fine for the next couple months, but no. <clears throat> so there is no conflict of interest with being Not on in that two case, different no. boards? Okay. And would you say that they given all of your work over the years and, and currently, is would there be any potential conflict of interest if you serve? Not the next related to my work. Uh, I do. <clears throat> I am in a butter to several sort of um, topics that will come before the board. I'm in a butter, not a direct butter, but I'm a butter to the uh, marijuana retail in the common. I live in the common. Uh, I I am in a butter. I think pretty. I think I'm a direct butter to the uh, proposed in the proposed development along Great Road. So the, I don't know if the, I, I would consider them conflicts, but those are issues. Yeah. So speaking of which, um, uh, are you familiar with form based code? And if so, what role impact do you believe it could have on the redevelopment of the common area? I'm familiar with it. I've been to many of the meetings. I have the latest draft. I'm very impressed with the effort. Um, I think that <coughs> it's um, a very appropriate forward-thinking uh, way of doing this. And I must say, with among colleagues, there's a little bit of buzz around the state about what's going on here with this, with this code. Um, so my main concern is that the all of this effort will come to very little if sewer the sewering of the common is not achieved. Um, I've been living in the common for 30 years, and I was as I was driving here, I was trying to think of the actual changes to the common in 30 years. CVS, <laughs> the Shell station and the Middlesex Bank, and that's it. That's all I can think of and in terms of structures in 30 years. And I wouldn't anticipate there'll be much more than that if the sewering doesn't happen. And I've come around on that, too, because initially I don't think I was uh, approving of it. However, if that does happen, we have to have, as you as a planning board, have to have a strategy to guide the growth that's going to potentially happen. If um, I would say that was also an impediment to my lack of support for the sewering because without something like the code that you're proposing, I think people would be very disappointed with the results of what they would get in terms of additional development in the common. And so I think it's a great effort. And, you know, I, I don't know the ins and outs. I know people are concerned about parking. They're concerned about this, concerned about that. <coughs> but I also, in my work with developers, know that no one is going to invest in a project that they don't think is going to be um, feasible. And if uh, just, be, you know, in terms of the parking, if there's not enough parking, they're not going to build the project like that. And that's my opinion, but based on the people I work with. So I, I'm complimentary to you folks for pursuing this. Who do you think should bear the cost for that? Cost of what? Implementing that sewer. Well, I would be because I would be able to connect to it, and it's not an insignificant uh, amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that any, any owner of property in the common uh, would <sighs> definitely benefit from whatever charges there are in connecting to it. Right. Um, My question is who bears the cost of building the sewer and not connecting to it? Well, we, well that, that, the sewer that's, isn't really Yeah, that's a financing issue and, and that's we sewer finance the planning absolutely board. the purview of the planning board if you're asking us to commit taxes, taxpayer money to building a sewer. This is a policy question. Well, not, I'm not, not sure not that the taxpayers question. are uh, I don't know. I don't know. However, it's bonded. It's it's based like any infrastructure, like any road, any um, any d development that any infrastructure that's built to spur development. It's done by a bond, and it's paid off by the people who are going to be using it. So, 
you know, I I understand. I have been involved in um, they call it water resource recovery. Um, over at Kimball Farm, they did a very elaborate big um, plant, and you know, they're complicated projects. So I understand people's concerns about um, how they're implemented, and uh, I have to leave that to the experts. All right, thank you. Um, so the town recently approved specific bylaws for development aimed at creating affordable housing in our community. Please provide your thoughts about these bylaws. And so um, I am in support of the inclusionary zoning. I don't know exactly what the end result is. I, I, I where the money goes to or how that's implemented, but I think as a as a policy, I think it was interesting. Uh, some years ago, I was involved in the when they did the housing. It was a maybe seven or eight years ago. They did the uh, housing production plan, and uh, that came up at that point. And at that point, I thought, and actually, it was in the housing production plan to consider that. And you did consider it. You adopted it. That was good. Um, the um, accessory apartment, <coughs> I, uh, from my role on the Board of Appeals, I'm not loving that bylaw in the way it's written, but I applaud its goals. Um, senior housing, I'm, I applaud the goal, but I'm skeptical that um, it's going to lead to affordable senior housing. Uh, because anything new is going to be unaffordable for the people who need it, and that's just the way it is. Um, I've been very, you know, as on the Board of Appeals, I was uh, involved in permitting the 40B at Great Road, 15 Great Road. Um, that was a, uh, you know, so I'm familiar with the overall state housing goals, which we exceed. We're pretty, you know, one of, I would, say we're one of the few exurban communities that exceed the 10 percent um, <coughs> state um, certified housing and this current census that's going to be conducted this year will probably reduce that because we've grown but uh, we've made a commitment to affordable housing and um, I think it's you know the the results are is that we have at least in the state size, we have sufficient affordable housing. <coughs> I've always been frustrated that we have affordable housing in town that's not included in that census, i.e. the trailer park. I mean, that's the definition of affordable housing, and yet it's not accounted for in any way in, in any census of, of housing in, the, in Littleton. Um, so I think in general, Littleton has uh, demonstrated commitment and, and been effective in, um, you know, achieving a certain level of, of affordable housing in town. You said an interesting thing in your introduction. You referred to zoning bylaws as sort of blunt instruments. Um, and then you listed some just recently in that response, certain things where you saw maybe deficiencies in our current zoning. So if you're going to sharpen one of our blunt instruments, where, where do you start as, as a matter of policy? Um, I can only say that I, I'm specifically speaking of the accessory apartment bylaw because uh, it has goals, uh, but it's it's – it's just confusing about, and this, it's not just Littleton's, it's, this happens in other towns too. It's, it's confusing in um, what constitutes the existing square footage of the house and blah, 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 and whether it's detached or unattached. And in, 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 in a way, that's an example of where maybe it could be uh, more blunt or I don't know. I, 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 I just think that that was, an example where you have a goal, you want to create um, this sort of, you know, secondary housing within people's, um, you know, existing structures or existing properties, and maybe it needs to be less blunt. I, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think there's 
there's an issue with, yeah, you don't want two families popping up everywhere, and I think, or maybe you do, you know, maybe you do. I don't know. I, <laughs> it, traditionally, we have not. I, I had a two family because it was built in 1820, you know, so it had been for, you know, since 1910. But um, I found in Littleton that was a, a, a negative, you know, in terms of, um, you know, so anyway. But in terms of the form-based code, what I really appreciated about the process that the planner went through is that they provided visuals. And they were not, you know, there was not a huge degree of specificity, but there was a definite look and feel to it that anyone could look at it and understand. Anyone coming in town and looking at property could look <coughs> at this and go, okay, that's what, that's what they want. That's what I'll get approved. And that's, um, that's definitely better than just some vague um, wordage about massing and detail and this and that and the other thing. So but from the architect's point of view, I like that. If I was hired by someone to come in and on a piece of property and, and propose something. All right, so you've been here 30 years. Yes. <clears throat> so you've seen the, the, the loss of farmland, the um, more housing coming in. 30 years ago, there was probably 6,500 people were now at about. I think it was. 5,500. No, no, no. It was like over seven, you know. 30 years? Yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah. 30 years. Ago. Yeah. So <clears throat> you've seen the, the, um, the loss of farmland. Mm -hmm. You've seen the attempt by the board to enact an open space bylaw, uh, try to preserve some sort of viable, viable open space there. Um, we did, we, we seem to have done a pretty good job with that. Overall, how would you change or do you see some things that we need to change from a planning board standpoint if you were on the board so my I think yes I think the planning board has done well I also think that for a long time the restraints on housing in town was more due to the Board of Health than the planning board until you know the last 10 or 15 years um, I guess my concern is it's not so much with um, the regulation of single-family homes. It's that there's no choice in town for anything but a single-family home, and not everyone wants to live in a single-family home. Um, I look at, once again, the garden apartments at <clears throat> 15 Greywood, which are the most plain, vanilla, generic, um, you know, Thing you could do and yet it's full it's expensive people are you know going into it they're building them on Westford they're turning down office buildings and building it in Westford and I think that's the market speaking um, that not everyone wants to live on a property uh, in in a single-family home and so I'm not saying that you know we should open the floodgates to that but I think we should be open you know, you talk about the station, you know, the Littleton station. I mean, transit-oriented housing is definitely a responsible thing that the planning board should be looking at. It sounds like you are. I don't know what the, what the process has been. Uh, that's a, you know, it's got access to major, you know, highways. It's got access to, to transport. And so let's say Durkee Farm is an example of something that's really a missed opportunity. Um, in terms of transit-based housing, in terms of building, you know, and I'm in the business of designing big houses, so, you know, I'm not, you know, against them in any way. <laughs> um, and most houses I design would dwarf the, the houses in Durkee Farm, so I'm not, I'm just saying that uh, as a planning board, it should be open to, you know, opportunities like that, which it sounds like you are. Thank you. So you just gave us your thoughts about potential future residential development. What about potential future commercial development? So we're in a um, we're in a uh, transition, I think, in the commercial real estate uh, uh, sector. Uh, retail is gone. Um, it's not gone, but it's going to be selectively, you know, developed in some you know, specific areas. Um, and office building is concentrated in the downtown area for whatever reason. That's just the way it is. 
we have empty office buildings, whereas 20 or 30 years ago, I think we all thought, this is it, 495, it's going to be this, you know, and um, it's not always going to be that way. Um, but right now, I think that's the way it is. I'm not aware of any office building development going on in this area. Um, worker, you know, workers, I guess, but that's a repurposing of a existing building. Anyway, so I think it's tough. I think it's. I think that it's. Um, it's definitely incumbent on the planning board to develop multiple um, ways of tax revenue, and that's everything: housing, commercial. You know, and I think we've had a pretty good balance. Um, and uh, but looking forward to depend on especially retail development, I think it's iffy at this point. So I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Um, from a planning perspective, um, would you like to state what you think the biggest concern is for Littleton? Well, I'm biased because of where I live, but I think the, um, you know, the common area is, um, something that people have talked about for 30 years and um, I, there's a little bit of momentum that I've been sensing for the first time in 30 years and when I see the cars lined up you know and I, I want to say I also work my offices in the common so I live in the common I walk four doors down I work in the common I know what's going on and um, you know there's a lot of traffic going through a rush hour and that doesn't bother me, you know, I can deal with it. It means that we have something valuable, you know, there that should be, you know, built on. And, you know, that, and we, we, as a planning board, I think your, you know, responsibility is to try to find the highest best use uh, for your community, for your tax base, for all aspects of things for any particular area. And right now, you know, we all understand single-family homes and, you know, vacant land and building houses, but it's taken some effort, as you know, to try to put together a vision for how the common can um, go forward and contribute rather than just be something that people drive through, so. And you don't think you'd, that would pose a conflict of interest for you? No, I think... I think that uh, do you live and work in the downtown and you're gonna vote on a bylaw that affects where you work well why not I mean people vote for you know I mean I think that I'm I'm probably uh, I think that if people are voting on a bylaw that's gonna affect me I should have the ability to vote on it and you've already stated that you think that that would improve your property right actually I think my property would possibly suffer because I'm looking at right now a field across from my house and as I, it's owned by the northern, you know, the northern bank, and I don't know what their plans are to do with it. But I, we have a little dead end street, you know, a dozen people on it, and people are hungry for places to walk and and uh, you know just tootle around. And I and and since living and working in the common, I do see people walking on our pitiful sidewalks. One thing that I would say is that I think the planning board has missed out on. No sidewalks on, you know, we have a whole side of Great Road that it doesn't have sidewalks. With all that, you know, when, when uh, I, you know, I don't know, that's a, a hot button for me. When I'm, I have my kids and strollers and I'm uh, like this and, but um, so I think I'm in a good position to understand what, um, might happen there and that's not the only issue before you know before you guys it's just something that is coming to the surface now with all the efforts you've been putting in okay any questions so we have a meeting on monday february 10th and then the first of the first thursday of every month after that um, through may do you foresee any attendance concerns no uh in through may the board of appeals meetings are on the third Thursday okay. all right and um, do you know 
very many of the board members here over your Yes, uh, I know Delisa. I've met Chase. Chase has been to my neighbor's house when we were talking about the dispensary. I know Cindy, our, our one, two of our daughters went to school together. Mm -hmm. I know Joe from many years. I know Chuck. I know you. I don't know you, and I know Mark. So, okay. anyway. Right. And, um, and I'm really thankful I haven't been coughing. I'm surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I should, this meeting should continue all day, and so I can keep me from coughing. Um, so is there anything else that you would like to add related to your um, qualifications or experience um, of what you would bring to the planning board? You, you've mentioned some, but I didn't know if you had anything else. No. I think I'm, I'm a long, you know, I'm a resident. I'm interested. I do have some particular skills professionally to bring to this. But I've always, uh, I should mention, you know, over the years, I've been against things and I've been for things. It's not always, you know, it's not always, um, you know, hasn't always been, you know, whatever is proposed I'm, you know, raising my hand for. So um, uh, I have, I would say over the years I have been somewhat involved, but not um, completely involved in the way that you all are and uh, I'm sort of interested in trying that out okay. so any other questions if not we'll ask mr. Yates if he has questions of us I think I'm all set okay I'm afraid that I'm gonna start <laughs> <laughs> your luck is going to run out all right yeah. well thank you very much for thank being you. here this evening thank you, thank you. As, I, as I mentioned to um, the other candidate thank you very much for Putting oh, your sure. hat in the ring and, and yeah. stepping forward and volunteering. Sure, through. thank you. So, in terms of deliberation, I think we have an arm wrestle. <laughs> okay. Well, Maybe BOS does that. That's how we operate in the BOS. <laughs> so, in terms of deliberations, um, opening it up for, for any comments. No one wants to go first. I just want can, can I just want to ask with re, with respect to form based code that does not pertain to the Robinson Road itself, right? It just pertains to the common district. Does that extend to Robinson Road? It does not. So it 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 doesn't. It doesn't. So so currently the boundary line that that is. Um, up for discussion with the planning board it extends to the first two homes on Robinson Road which are the dental office mm. and the oh, antique that the town. Bank, yes the bank which, is, which is the exit it's basically follows the business district zoning line okay yes right. so it nothing commercial would be introduced that isn't already commercial. right and I just wanted to I should ask you this question Jeff when you were sitting there you work on the common, but you don't own the building that you work in, no. correct? Okay. That's all. Okay. But can I make one comment about that? No, you don't. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Three one one Great Road, which is you know Sherry Gold owns it with uh, Mark. Um, I mean the engineer. Um, that's. If anyone wants to know what the form ba base code will, you know, could develop, it's that building. It's essentially the code. You could use that building as a model for this, you know, this code that's being proposed. And it's a, you know, it's a type of development that's broken down to scale, and and it's filled with people like myself, an engineering, you know, thriving engineering company, a law office. That could be the you know if they build it maybe those type of businesses will come to the common area with yeah, additional parking. <laughs> well, they, I would say that their parking is stressed. All right. So, what's the process for voting? Or you have to nominate someone and then say yay or nay and then. He doesn't get it. Go to the next one. Or do you discuss the? Pro well, the actually, it's, it's, it's open for a full discussion now. If yeah. you want to talk about, so I, uh, I'll jump up. All right. Please so <clears throat> I think um, again, I appreciate appreciate both candidates coming forward and uh, you know kind of putting themselves in the gauntlet and allowing us to ask them questions and, and kind of extract some information from them. Um, clearly, if, we, if we're looking at the two of them as far as experience with Littleton specifically um, and with experience 
serving the town. Um, Jeff had a, a ton of experience there, being serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals. There are some, uh, having served on a uh, Board of Appeals, uh, Zoning Board of Appeals board in a previous community, there's there's a lot of back and forth between the Planning Board and, and the ZBA. So I think there's, there's a lot of experience there that would translate. Um, the fact that Jeff has been here for 30 years, he's seen a lot of what's going on. He's, he's kind of experienced, he's, he's an active member of our community as far as attending things and knowing what's going on. Um, so he, he's you know, he was able to speak freely about what's happened and um, some of the some of the different changes because many of the zoning changes, the bylaw changes, were very very much um, inclusive of the ZBA. Um, that being said, I mean Eli Eli has a, a wealth of experience, albeit he's he's only been here for three years, so um, doesn't necessarily know the lay the lay of the land. Um, I, I think that there's there's a certain appeal to having a fresh set of eyes and not lose somebody who's experienced on the zoning board of appeals. Um, but I, I think there's uh, you know having run construction projects and having that that kind of knowledge will translate to some extent. To, to what extent I, I can't I can't speak to that. The, Eli said without question that he would be willing to run for the seat in May. Jeff. Ultimately said yes he would, but <laughs> kind of I don't know. I thought about it. I talked to Sherry, and you know, so he's kind of on the fence. But I think ultimately, if if, if we did appoint him, I, I feel that he would in fact step forward and uh, put his his hat in there and, and run for that for the full five year seat. Um, the the only concerns I have with Jeff, it, you just kind of brought them up, Jerry, was relative to some of the. Um, big projects that we have going on relative to the master plan, the sewer. Um, there's some things that are going to be before us that, frankly, he's in all likelihood going to have to recuse himself from, whether it be 531 King Street, Northern Bank and Trust development, much of the form-based code stuff, perhaps the sewer stuff. I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Why? If he do. doesn't fall in... If he falls in the district, he absolutely... But he doesn't fall in the district. No, I, I am in the district. He does he fall in the district. Oh, okay, but I thought he was saying... From, from a work right. perspective. From, no, I, I'm in the district this. of the sewer district. Right, right. but we don't... Right, in the sewer, but uh, sewer's board of selectmen. We're not sewer. So in terms of form-based code, he doesn't fall within the district. That's and if you consider them separate projects. I would also yeah, argue, exactly. and I've argued this with the sewer, it, I would argue that the sewer form-based code are large enough that there's a certain threshold at which, yes, every one of us is impacted by sure. certain things. That's right. And to the extent that we need counsel to weigh in on this point, I mean, with respect to, like, the sewer and, you know, Anna's Sorry. in the district with respect to sewer, same with form-based code. Those are community-wide yeah, I'm, issues. I, so I wasn't looking for rebuttals. I was just looking to kind of lay the, I know, lay but the there's cards clearly, out. There, but there's just, clearly a differentiation between being in that zone and being impacted directly, i.e. you could be improved by that, and versus who's actually paying for that. So if there's a debate there, then yeah, it could raise conflicts of interest. But again, we, we if don't If you're going to look at this sewer. like we have a sewer project and we have a form-based code, read the literature in the form-based code. It's dependent on sewer. No, it's not. No, it says no. it in the code. It's it not, says it it's in your not dependent on sewer. I just read it. Without the sewer, you <coughs> won't be able to implement. You don't have the septic to support the density. It's I, just in the plan. I think you're missing the big point of the whole thing, though, Jerry. We're just, we're just a board. Okay, this is going to go to town meeting. He's one voice. Just he can like go to town meeting, yeah. Right, so I don't think it's that important <coughs> what his opinion of phone based code or the sewer or that kind of stuff is any different than my opinion and your opinion just because he lives there it's still one voice it's all going to go to town meeting to be voted whether he abstains from it whether he's opposed to it or whatever it's going to go to town meeting so that is going to go to town it's, meeting it's no. sort of a moot point is, is the point i'm getting at the fact that he's like directly impacted it doesn't it's not i am not so um nina Yes. Do you have any comment regarding this conflict of interest question that's on the table? Unfortunately, um, I was actually just about to send a message to Marin to say that if you have any clarifications regarding any of the details, please chime in. I wish she, I, I had realized she was in the audience and I would have suggested that she sit up with us. But um, on the note of whether or not I can opine, unfortunately I can't 
truly and really that is something that either the State Ethics Commission should be providing a, a written opinion on or Town Council could provide a opinion on. It would be um, it would be too preliminary of me at this stage to, to try to guess what legal would advise in this subject. With respect to the sewer or form based code or both? I guess in many senses I think we're getting the weeds. I, I, yeah. Literally, yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I literally was making some comments yeah. and got interrupted. <laughs> so I would say just continue with your comments, people. Let's nominate somebody and let's vote on it. Okay. If, in fact, we nominate somebody that is within a district or if there's something that's going to happen down at the Cooper Farm area, if, if it's uh, Eli that gets selected, then we'll bring it to town council. I, I, I wouldn't, I didn't, didn't get to finish my comments, but I wouldn't say I would necessarily not select one candidate over another candidate based upon some potential conflicts. Because to Chase's point, any one of us could have any potential conflict with any development at any time. Sure. But I wasn't able to finish, so. <laughs> oh, right. sorry. I interrupted so, you. <laughs> it's just a respect thing. Do you want to finish now? I'm done. Okay. okay. I'll remember that. So some of the projects that I think are going to be coming before the planning board over the next couple of months um, in addition to form based code um, uh, we have 5g that's out there we have Healy corner um, items on Cooper farm do pop up now and again items on Durkee K do pop up now and then um, we have 151 Taylor Street with a new office and warehouse we have 250 Taylor the terrace property um, and uh, we have um, the potential for for Northern Bank to to propose something the point so those are a lot of the projects that we have in front of the board as well as um, transfer development rights so there was some discussion about farms and open space so just to give the Board of Selectmen a, a sense of what we have on the docket as well. I need to sit down with you at some point and just go through some organizational skills. Just watching you go through it. <laughs> Anytime, Chuck. Yeah. You Anytime. also have the revitalization of the train station. You didn't even mention that. I can't I apologize. That. Yes. I think it boils down to two things. It boils down to one candidate has been in Littleton for 30 years, knows Littleton, has grown up through Littleton, that has definitely some pluses to it. Some people might think that moving here from another state, coming here, moving into Littleton, being here for a year or two, and having a fresh outlook on Littleton would have a, you would have a, a, a unique perspective on it, and they should be on the, the planning board. Having been the curmudgeon on the board for as many years as I have, I like the idea of somebody that has actually seen firsthand what we've done in the town, how we've done the open space, um, how we, we crafted the bylaw, because it's 30 years old, and how we thought, the, the thought process for the past 30 years has been, uh, I'm, I think both would be excellent, I don't, and I actually don't have a problem with either one. If I was to nominate somebody, and I'm not saying that right now, the only thing I'm trying to say is I, I like the experience that Jeff brings to the table. I also like the experience that he brings in regards to other towns. The fact that he has worked with planning boards in Needham, Newton, or with residential development in those areas. I think it gives us some, you know, a different perspective within our, our surrounding area, which I think would be very valuable. I'd like to hear how other things are being done, how things are being done in other towns. To Mark's point about some people may prefer this some people may prefer that they have a choice three and a half months from now the, right uh, frankly <laughs> it, i mean that's what it comes down to right I, yeah. of the two candidates in the next three and a half months i see jeff coming up to speed faster I, I would frankly i would prefer a candidate who said i'm just here for a caretaker role since neither of them said that i'm inclined to support jeff because i think in the next three and a half months he will be more helpful and then the voters get to decide See, I agree. I'm exactly. I'd like somebody that wants to be here for a while. Once they get in and get get their feet wet, because it takes a little while to kind of get up. And although I don't think Jeff will have much of a problem, I've already been on a, a regulatory board. 
it's just not have to do it again three months from now to have some sort of stability on the board. And that's not to say we're not going to have an election with two people running, but still at least we have the option of, of some sort of continuity. It's been a little helter skelter the past couple of years. Oh, I get that. I, I just have a philosophical opposition to the uh, the credibility of incumbent when you're a three and a half month incumbent. So. I don't think there's a clear enough differentiation between the two. Well, we can flip a coin. Well, I, I nominate Jeff Yates. So I'll just put it out there if I'm allowed to do that. Is that a motion? Can you make, is that a motion? I guess. Are we done with the discussion? Are we done with the discussion? Well, does anybody else have any other comments before? I agree with Jerry that either I think either one would be really? fine with the board. I don't have anything to do. I don't know Jeff from Adam, but I'll tell you after having heard him tonight, I'd, I'll sleep well knowing you got the position. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. That's so you're not going to run again. I was out of the room. Motions on the floor. So we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. Can we just formalize the motion? Can we revise yes. the motion to yeah. formalize it at this point to make sure that it's consistent with? Would our clerk oh, like so to that was, read that it? So that was a nomination. A nomination. Okay. So fine. Right. Yep. Yeah, sure. I saw it as a nomination. That's what I. Yeah. That's what I said. So do we have a second? Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, all in favor? You want us to raise a hand? Say um, aye. How about we go through a, each no, individual? Not, I don't think. I, I think not necessary. Based upon what Eli just said, I think that we have. I think we have consensus, and I don't think. I think we can certainly. Just okay. Move, move it. I would at this point say. Yeah, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. We have a unanimous vote to appoint Jeff Yates for the next three and a half months. Thank you. Could we also go through the formal yeah. motion? What that says with move that the Board of Selectmen <laughs> and Planning Board vote to appoint Jeffrey Yates to the Planning Board pursuant to MGL Chapter 41, Section 81A for a term through May 9th, 2020. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Done. Can have the motion perfect. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nina, I would love to have these for the plan. Are we done? <laughs> <laughs> All right. She's your boss. Well, you're going over Nice. Nice. That kind of, that kind of <laughs> Moving on. Do we have more on? Right. Yeah. Are we done? Are we done? point of clarity. No. Nope. Gentlemen, thank you very much again, both of you. Thank you. Um, Eight o'clock joint Martin, meeting with the planning board and the master plan of the implementation committee as follows up for December 16th. Just a small correction that ever made it to your uh, <coughs> the MP. The master plan implementation committee did not vote to have a joint meeting with you. I was delegated as the chair to come speak to you tonight. Okay. That's it. And uh, I spoke to <coughs> Nina earlier. She said it would be corrected, but. You're very busy. I know you want to get home real fast to <laughs> catch up. I just want you to know that even I have apps on my cell phone that picked up the Iowa results uh, before they were released. So something's going on out there on the Internet. So uh, I'm here tonight basically to seek your support. Uh, actually, both boards, since you're both here. I've got you captive. Uh, both boards, I'm, I'm seeking you on behalf of the Master Plan Implementation Committee a funding of $10,000 to be expended, and I'll be happy to give you the purpose for it, um, but the timeline will be for it. More than likely, the effort will be under, shall we say, more defined planning, and what I mean, I'll explain to you in a moment, but itself won't be implemented until after the town meeting, and I'll give you what we have in mind. Basically, it comes down to this, that the, uh, I could bring the master plan up uh, up here but there are quite a number of items on that list and what's coming up next maybe maybe not on the next warrant are key items that will shall we say will inform all of us and I mean by all of us what will be the next steps after the town meeting and in other words I'm not I'm I'm here simply to say I do not know unless you know what the town's view will be on the next step of sewering. I don't even know if sewering will make it in its full-blown form. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns between now and then. 
don't know. Uh, as far as I know, form based the other items, uh, for example, I'm going to go through many of them, but the, the two main ones that have occupied you tonight a little bit and will in the future, uh, form based code. Again, um, you still have another hearing to go through, another draft. Uh, MPEG has its own views about how uh, solid that, <clears throat> that is and has, has been. Uh, so the idea here is that this is a master plan, and if you look at our master plan, it is, in fact, has many things on it that the town residents indicated a very strong preference for. And it includes such things as an intergenerational, I'm using the words that are in the plan, um, community center. It includes a, a greater attention that we've been able to give to, let's say, the balance between or the balance how open space and development move together, even though we have stacks of studies that have not been ever implemented fully and shown how it could be used. So until MPIC has a clear idea of where the town stands as of the next uh, town meeting about elements in the master plan, we can't advance to you the very specific things that we have in mind to do if A, B, or C, or D occur. And I don't think you do either. And our job is to provide guidance and promotion of the master plan. And rather than, shall we say, lay out for you very specifically that these are the five areas that we are going to absolutely pursue, pursue no matter what, and in what form we're going to do it, I can't give you that information tonight. Now, as far as MPIC spending money, I've received two emails um, asking questions about MPIC's uh, use of funds. Now, so far, according to my records, uh, which I haven't got that many because all the MPIC has really done is it expended $144,000 to do what basically is the roadmap for the common. And we did that with the full knowledge of the planning board and with their support. And we, it was MPIC who wrote the proposal with the assistance of the planning department. And we also got a grant from the state, returning some of our tax monies back to us. Um, and we went ahead with, uh, and basically came up with basically a guide on, on where and how and what you would do in order to develop the common, to revitalize it. And it's fairly detailed with a number of deliverables, including, I'm not going to mention them all, but significantly enough, one that you're already looking at, and that's form-based code as a response to something that the town residents express a very strong preference for. The other thing which may not be appreciated is that it, it, was a, it has proven to be a very useful tool just to put in front of certain parts of it, in front of the property owners of the common and elsewhere to give an idea of what Littleton is thinking about. And it has made a very positive impression on those property owners. The other thing MPIC has done and why its name is very often associated with other projects is we did contribute to by helping write proposals for uh, the planning board. Uh, we also uh, encouraged and the formation of the, the transportation, uh, uh, shall we say, omnibus committee led by our, our former colleague, Gary, who I think he's still here, um, that basically has been bringing together all the, shall we say, various activities for transportation. So there's approximately 10 items that are clear high deliverables that we got from the $144,000 that went through the revitalization of the common map. The master plan is not a stone written document. It is something that is obviously subject to change. At its inception and when it was finished by the steering committee, there were two things that we tried to emphasize. One was making sure that the town retained an idea that the various components they were looking for were related to each other. In other words, that we were trying to reduce the silos of interest in the town where you want X, you go after X, and then you, you leave Y off to the side until you feel you're ready and have the support for Y. The master plan was an attempt to, to convey to the town the idea that there are no, shall we say, advocates for priorities. That what's really at stake here is, and what the rate limiting step has been, is very frankly the resources. Do we have enough funds? to do the major components. 
and I'm not going to go through the list of the major components. You've been living with them for a while. So what you're here for tonight is to ask for $10,000? I'm explaining to you precisely why the MPIC is trying to see where the town feels it ought to be by looking at the actions taken in town meeting, how they respond to your leadership, where they feel that they're going, and at that point, we can respond accordingly with appropriate guides. There will be no hire. We don't need to hire consultants. We have nice? all the information that we have, that we need, and we have the experience that we have. So this would be basically, depending on what comes out, forums and other meetings with the public post-town meeting. What's the answer? Mr. Mr. Chair, yeah. um, if I may, mm -hmm. um, to provide some context around all of this, I, I'd like to take a step back for just a moment. I know it's late, but I, I really beg for everybody's um, time for just a minute. I think it's important, Mr. Zeldin has come before the Planning Board and before the Board of Selectmen in the past couple of months. One of the things that I think is important is for us to collectively um, agree as to what the charge for MPEC is and where the work for MPEC should come from. Is it something that the Board of Selectmen, because MPEC reports to the Board of Selectmen, and here is the information from the master plan that identifies um, what the role is of MPEC. I'm sorry, I don't have enough copies so if you can share. Um, and being able to identify, for example, um, from the middle part, page 171, sunset the master plan update steering committee, replacing it with a master plan implementation committee reporting to the Board of Selectmen. So this is why I bring this up. I, I'm sorry, let me interrupt. Because if you look at the legislation or the, the motion that made by the planning board and the board of selectmen, to me it's a moot argument. Our function is to provide guidance and, and basically promotion. There's nothing in there about reporting. In fact, I would argue that it's contrary to an implementation committee of your master plan to report in the sense to act as the to to view the planning board to review the board of selectmen and or the planning board to get their instruction about what could or could not be implemented you like we're looking at the actual document that says reporting. i know what you're looking at so i'm looking at the charge given at the time the text is very nice but with the intention but what's in the written legislation what we're limited to is promotion and guidance there is no mention here that doesn't there's no mention say, here that there's a budget. There's no mention here. There's a lot of things. But that's you're right. here tonight to ask for ten thousand dollars, and we kind of want to know what that ten thousand dollars is. I on. perfectly understand your question. I'm trying to do my best to tell you that at the at the moment, if I said to you, "Oh, we're going to be looking into the last five things that are on our list of seven, All right. I don't can't put that in context. Can Let, I think so, we're going finish her. So what, why do you need it now? Why can't you wait till after town meeting? Then you can tell us what you want it for. I, it was my understanding that you needed to hear from me now so that the funds would be available post town meeting. If it's not, I'll be happy. going to the budget. Yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in. Not discretionary line items in the budget? I mean, they're not discretionary line items, but there is the opportunity to do. Um, line item transfers. Yeah, and reserve fund transfers yeah. or something like that if there's. You don't have to make the meeting. We still have 26000 sitting in the master yeah. plan. That's what I was. Just, that's what I wanted to ask. It's, if, if, if the data, because can we? I'm sorry, to, Mike. Please go ahead. But Anna was kind of trying to make a point. Yeah, if we could just Anna. let her finish her yeah. point. So I have two main points. One is I wanted to to address. So where where does the work that the master plan implementation committee come from? Is it work that is requested by the board of selectmen, or is it work that impacts these? And so what direction does it go? Okay. Right. The second question or comment that I have, and I don't know if Marin has copies for everybody. So FinCom requested on January 14th, I think it was, to provide background information as to where all the master plan money that has been appropriated gone to. Um, Marin and I and Cheryl provided that data, and I don't know if you saw that on Saturday as a result. So as an example, 
um, of the dollars that have been um, requested May 7th, 2018, $10,000 was to be expended um, for needs associated with implementation of the town's master plan. Um, only a small amount of that $10,000 was appropriate, or excuse me, was actually spent. Currently, May 6, 2019, $12,000 was to be expended for land use coordination planning, but we haven't had an opportunity to do that. So I think it is important to be able to identify what dollars will be used for and then that we ensure that the dollars are actually being used for that. So as we consider, as you consider, because again, MPIC reports to the Board of Selectmen, as you consider the request for 10,000, you know, consider that in the past dollars have been requested, but we haven't used them. So, so I just wanted to point that out. Right. And if you'd like to see the information, I have it and Maren has it. Mr. Chair, I, I, could I ask you a question? <clears throat> I'm a little confused here. When you talk about money for the Mike, Mike, Mike I yeah. just, oh, sorry, if I ahead. just wanted to comment for once, sure. just to build on what Anna just said um, with respect to appropriations that haven't been spent. Right. One of the things that I wanted to talk about was the roadmap that you had mentioned, which Correct. is an awesome report. I, everybody should have a copy of the roadmap, seriously. There is such great information in that report. But one of the things that sort of bothers me is that there's an implementation plan for the, the Littleton Common Roadmap. There's objectives that have been identified that the Board of Selectmen should be spearheading, that the Planning Board should be spearheading, that transportation, who actually are paying attention to the roadmap, um, it, but don't have the funding, that's a whole other story, are, are following through on. So I think one of the things that sort of bothered me personally was if I hadn't read the roadmap, I wouldn't have known what the Board of Selectmen was supposed to be working on. And I really would hope through the Master Plan Implementation Committee that that would have come back to the Board. And this is just, I would have appreciated you coming, and I know you presented the report to us, but really saying to the Board of Selectmen, hey, some of it direct, uh, relates directly to the sewer project. This is what you guys should, our board should be focusing on for the sewer project. And then following back up with us and saying, hey, where are you guys at with that? Um, so that's just one of my comments about the role of the Master Plan Imp Implementation Committee. And the other thing I wanted to ask is, what have we implemented? Like, I would love to have a report that shows what we implemented and we should have celebrated those accomplishments. It says in the Master Plan, that those accomplishments are supposed to be presented at town meetings so the whole town can see what we've accomplished um, through the master plan and we've, we've failed that, we haven't done that. So I just, I mean, I think the purpose really of this discussion I hoped was just to get us back on track um, and to just review what we have accomplished and sure. just try to come up with a game plan going forward. I personally am not in favor of uh, voting to approve funding for something that might happen contingent upon other things that could happen or not happen in May. Especially when there's already funds available. And especially when there's already funds available based on the information that we've been given by our financial team. Right. And if I may, I'd like to just respond. Mm -hmm. This is fine. Yeah. However, the I'd like to point out to you, and we've I've made this point to you on several occasions in the meeting, almost word for word what you just said back to me about the connection between form-based code, the sewer system, uh, the uh, community center, the importance of the railroad, the railroad area. Uh, this has been conveyed to you. And, and I'd also point out that also the needs, the we'll call the building needs, space needs. You've gone through three, at least three rounds of get, trying to get help to get your hands around what to do with this. This is also in the master plan. When I come before you and you are, you during your own meetings, you will cite the fact that, oh, this is in the master plan. I'm sitting here, yes, it's in the master plan. And you will assign whoever it is on your board that has an interest expertise in pursuing it. So, yes, I will certainly take the responsibility of broadcasting what has been accomplished so far and celebrate it. Uh, but the, and my job is to, as, as you correct, uh, correctly point out, my job is to promote or use the committee to help the committee promote the, the master plan 
so that the town can continue to be engaged to it to the extent that the town wants to be engaged with it. So it, if, if you wish to celebrate the success, you have heard tonight whether you were, uh, whether you were talking about safety and water, because that's in the master plan. It, I mean, the, the Mike, list you heard tonight I guess, was it. And I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. what initiatives that the, we've spent this money, what have we accomplished in the master plan? What have we achieved? Specifically, <laughs> you, you, I mean, like the affordable housing trust. I'm going to use that as an example. Yes, we have an affordable we, housing trust. You have started on, you have made it. You're starting on an attempt to understand how to better use this building. It's going to be broadly speaking. The other objective of the master plan is a modern uh, uh, library. There is one. Right. All right. So I guess what I'm asking is, it would be great just to have those that all laid out. I mean, I know these are conversations. I'll going be back very happy forth. to. I'll be happy to collect all of them. Right. Very happy to collect all of them. And and, 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 and to yeah. be honest, there, the master plan implementation committee was kicking around doing that last fall, and I was one of the uh, doing exactly that sort of outlining. Yeah. Here are the some things that, that we've accomplished. Been done. Right. Some has been yeah. done. It has not been seen through, and I'm not an insignificant barrier right that's concerned. i just think that so it is on the master plan implementation committee's radar, radar yeah. it's moving it's not moving as quickly as it should and it's certainly not moving as fast as would be beneficial for the community right um, but your point is a is a good one that that's that is one of the main roles of mpec aggregate everything that we're doing line it up with the master plan and keep score yeah I just think it would be helpful. I think it's sure. also just a matter of reminding people that all these initiatives that are currently, we're going through it. Nothing has been implemented yet, but we're going through it and reminding people that, hey, this is on a master plan. And I don't know, Cindy, if you've seen this document. I think, Maren and Anna, you pulled this together, but it outlines where the funds were spent okay. and why. Right. Okay. And I believe Which, they received that as part of yeah. the FinCom BOS meeting okay. on Saturday. Yeah. And, I, and so I guess just my other final point is, if we have the Littleton Common Roadmap, we haven't completed the roadmap yet. We're still working on it, right? So shouldn't that be like a focus of our initiatives right now and where we're going to, because I think some of the goals, objectives in the roadmap are going to cost money to. Oh, yes. So well, that's yeah. a priority discussion for us, right? I right. mean, do we, the, the roadmap, right, is specific to the, no solely specific to the common but that there are there's a lot to the master plan that isn't the common right so do, do we, we want to dedicate our resources to that right. or do we want to be more broad about right. it and i think that that sits with us right to have that discussion yeah but doesn't some of that really depend on what happens at town meeting because you've got the sewer well some of it's to help promote uh, right. not promote but to help um give support for what we want to have, you know, for articles that are coming forward at town meeting, like funding sources for people that want to die into the sewer, for example, is in a, it's in a recommendation that the Board of Selectmen have that discussion. Do we want to create something? Do we, do we want to partner with a bank to help residents provide them with a funding source for tying into the sewer? We haven't had that discussion, but it's in the roadmap. I oh, guess yeah. my concern is we're not following the roadmap yet. We're ready to veer off and do oh, something I, else. You know. Let's take your example as a as a salient one. Um, some groups have had that discussion. It hasn't percolated up to the level of the board yet. But the sewer working group actually that was one of the things that I brought up at sewer working group meetings uh -huh. in part because that was that's something that I've heard both the board say is interesting as well as. MPEC and, and other sources right. say, as, a, as well as the community say, right. is interesting. So it's a communication issue and a recognition And I was just using that as an example. But I no, it's a good one. Though. It's a good one because it's important. Yeah, and, and when I look at this, $10,000. Yeah, yeah, I know we're kind of going all Yeah, we're kind of going all over the place. If, yeah. not, if, if, if we have consensus, we're not, we're not looking to put another $10,000 into the budget. I, I'm scale. less interested, excuse me, Chuck, we're, done, right? you're, you're st we're still, I'm less, the, the money would be helpful if it wasn't, a, that is, the request would be more viable to us if there were no money, as you're claiming, available in the, in the shall we say, still in the, in the, in the pot. W what I'm interested in, however, is your interest in communicating to the public all the items that have been accomplished so far in the master plan. Let me just put it th this way, that MPIC is prepared 
if you feel that you could be assisted leading up to and within town meeting of materials from MPIC that would help make it very clear what has been accomplished so far, MPIC stands ready to assist. We do not require money to do that. I could see it something as easy as a PowerPoint presentation that's flashing over the screen, you know, just kind of highlighting different things that have been done, pictures right. of things with a little, little narrative while people are walking into town meeting. You know, just this is what we've accomplished, and, and just literally just rolling through it. Right. Well, I don't think it has to be necessarily a presentation. I don't think you have to become. No, I'm not, it. not interested in being part of the show. It would be very helpful if we had just a brief, so we make sure that we're on the same script. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Uh, MPIC is, is in a position to start doing that. Uh, just give me give us a brief hint of when you decide what it is that you would feel would be most valuable to have flashing in front of them. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And, yep. and if I may say, um, having been an MPEC member, there are six or seven members at any given time on MPEC. And if the Board of Selectmen had any specific charge, I know that folks would be pretty excited about you know having that charge. And I think we've mentioned that that we want to we want to make yeah. sure that we're. we're better connected you can always be better connected and, right. and giving direction to all of the boards and committees right. and commissions and you know, all the people that are out there running around volunteering their time showing up on any given number of nights to right. try to get stuff done if if people are going down the wrong path and we're not giving them direction shame on us right so, yeah, I, 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 one, I, one final request whoever you mic. have a point when you appoint someone from your board to MPIC please impress on them the need to show up for at least not in person at least in written form Okay, so we can get the benefit of, of the uh, communicate with you more rapidly. This is seeing it. You. <laughs> and and it goes you, for the other. I give you a lot of text for the last. Thank meeting. you, Mike. Okay, thank thanks you. a lot. Thanks, thanks for waiting thanks around. Yep. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Second. Aye. Aye. Favor. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Yes. Adjourn. Aye. 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 Aye.